Maraming naganap sa nakaraang taon. We were faced with uncertainties. You're a good teacher. I'm proud of you. Kaya lang, kulang ka sa training eh. Balikan natin yung rason kung bakit natin pinili ang profession na ito. The question is, are you ready to own the challenge? ay nagsimula po nung mapansin namin may mga learning gaps po ang aming estudyante sa pagkatuto sa mathematics at saka sa pagbabasa at tamang pagtutunog ng mga letra. Dahil po sa mga learning gaps na ito, nagkaroon po kami ng ideya na gumawa ng digital app sa mathematics. So, nagamit po namin itong digital app na ito upang mapaglinang pa at mapaghusay yung kanilang pagkatuto sa mathematics. Diyan din po kami nagka-idea since mababa din po yung readers namin sa school namin at that time sa Millennium Castello Elementary School, dyan din kami nagka-idea na dagdagan pa ng innovation. Ang lagi ko po sinasabi, lagi, it takes always a village to build a child, di ba? Dapat andyan pa rin po yung partisipasyon ng mga magulang na hindi lamang po full effort ni teacher ang gumagawa. May mga estudyante din kasi po ako na talagang hirap na hirap sa buhay. So sila din po yung naging inspirasyon ko na ipakita sa kanila na kahit anumang pagsubok, kahit anumang hirap sa buhay, sa tamang pagpupursige at tamang pagsusumikap, kayang-kaya lahat ng anumang bagay. Sa mga gusto pong sumali sa innovation po ng Simeo Inotech, ang maibibigay ko lang pong payo or advice po ay lagi nating titignan kung ano nga ba yung mga learning gaps o problema na pinanggagalingan. So doon po tayo hugot kung anong klaseng innovation ng ating implement para mabigyan ng intervention kung ano man yung mga pangangailangan at maitutulong ng ating mga estudyante.
So IMPACT stands for Instructional Management by Parents, Community, and Teachers. The system actually is, is designed holistically, uh, mm -hmm. uh, involving the parents and other stakeholders, and then the teachers and the learners. Oh, if you use the IMPACT, you know what the learners uh, benefit most is that they develop their confidence, yes. their leadership skills, and their socialization skills. Actually, po kapag sinabi natin lifelong, so the, the learning process goes beyond po sa parameters po ng school po. Tama. It should be, kasi in our daily lives po, ano-ano po yung na-encounter natin. So, minsan po, yung ano po yung natuturo sa room, magagamit po natin beyond outside of the classroom right, po. Right, right, right. Regardless of the situation we have to consider that education is a continuous learning process. If there is a pandemic or no pandemic. We have to develop in our learners the socio-emotional learning. And this usually starts from the heart of our learners. And so, this socio-emotional learning, when we have love, commitment ng school and the teachers. Pag committed ang dalawang ito, hindi makakaproblema. Si teacher, sa pag-coach kay leader, kay third group leader, kasi ito ang basic na kailangan ready si leader sa kanyang mga modules para sa kanyang members. Uh, may isang bata na yung nanay niya ng anak at yung tatay nagtratrabaho sa ibang bayan. So, kailangan niyang tumulong kay nanay sa mga gawain bahay. Kaya nag-absent muna si ate. So, yun, pinadalhan namin siya ng mulyon para sa free time niya sa bahay, mas pasagutan niya yun. At pagbalik niya sa klase, syempre, hindi siya magpupuli kasi makakatch up niya yung lessons ng mga araw na absent siya. Ang ganda, Miss Heidi, kasi ano, kinoconsider ninyo yung family life ng mga bata, no? Yung conditions nila, kinoconsider nyo pa din. Opo, para mas maging confident sila na pumasok. Mas ma-feel nila yung pagmamahal natin sa kanila. At sa pamamagitan ng mamahal na yun, mas, uh, mas ma-excite sila na pumasok sa paaral na. So, doon sa tatlong sinabi ko, so kunyari, program teaching, peer group learning, individual study, anong paborito mo? Kung maaalala mo yung experience mo sa impact? Para sa akin po, yun yung ano, pinaka the best yun doon yung sa program teaching kasi very challenging talaga oh, siya. Oo, oh, saka nagtuturo ka doon. Oh. Kung baga, habang nagtuturo kami hmm. sa mga kapwa estudyante, hmm. namumotivate din kami na pag-aralan muna yung topic. Tama, oo. Oh. Bago ito, oh. para kung baga yung nagiging point doon is mastery. Tama, tama. Ang importante talaga na nade-develop mo doon is the emotional um, intelligence to deal with younger kids or other people basically dealing with different types of people ganyan you have to um, adjust yourself para mapa mapaintindi mo sa kanila kung anong gusto mong sagutin at anong gusto mong ipaintindi and that was really fun for me because i think because of that um I think I became more socially adept because of oh. that. Gano ka ka-proud? Kung baga, kung nasa high school ka or nasa college ka, paano mo kinikwento ang impact learning system sa mga kaibigan mo? Na, alam nyo ba, meron kaming sistema ng grade school na napakaganda? Hindi lang naman po dahil sa natuto po kayo magbasa, magsulat. Mm -hmm. Pero isa lang po yung pinagmamalaki namin. Dahil po sa environment, nakakasama namin iba't ibang grade level, nagiging people smart din po kami. Wow, ang ganda ng term na yun, ha? Oo. Yes, po. Umiintindi din po kami sa kapwa at naatay namin yun sa realidad. Technology advances at a rapid speed and kids are going online at younger ages. So, how can parents guide their children in safely navigating the digital world? Hi, I'm Kay, and today we're going to ask Inotech parents about digital parenting. Come along! Yes. <laughs> 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 Can I ask you something? 
po, what comes into oh. mind when you hear the words digital parenting? Oh, wala, wala akong kaalam alam niya. What do you know so far about digital parenting? Ito yung pag-update ng knowledge ng parents regarding sa uh, online, since online na yung classes natin sa bata. Pag-guide mo sa mga anak mo, pag-browse nila sa internet, ganyan, mm -hmm. kung ano yung mga sites na pinupuntahan nila. That's right. More on explanation siguro. Kasi ngayon, most of the kids kasi, di ba, through internet na. Kung merong actual parenting, <laughs> merong digital parenting. Kung paano mo ito-parent yung anak mo through digital world. What do you think of when you hear the words digital parenting? You are included or alam mo kung ano yung activities ng children mo online. To me, it's my you know, ongoing challenge. Digital parenting for me is more of how to manage uh, the usage of those uh, gadgets. In this book, digital parenting is defined as the efforts of parents to reduce potential risks and enhance opportunities for their children in the digital environment. You see, parenting today is a lot more complex than it was in the previous generations. The advent of digital technology does not only add more challenges for parents to think about, but they also need to cope with the faster pace of change that potentially brings additional threats to children's safety and well-being as they explore cyberspace and digital media. It can be overwhelming to stay in control and almost impossible to monitor everything. And while it seems like the easiest thing to do is give up and walk away, the best thing to do is to learn as much as you can. Arm yourself with knowledge and skills that can help you better guide your kids towards maximizing the benefits of digital media and online platforms. To know more about digital parenting, follow us on social media. We will post tips, strategies, and innovative ways to guide and protect your child as they navigate the digital world. If you want to share yours, let us know and drop them in the comments below. See you again next time! Hi, I'm Joanne, and just like you, I'm a parent concerned about the time that my child spends online. But to tell you honestly, there's really no magic figure. It really depends on many factors. For example, your child's age and maturity. Of course, the younger they are, the more guidance they need. And as they grow old, that guidance may be a little bit more complex. Secondly, you also want to see what type of content they are engaging in. Are they just passively watching, perhaps playing games, researching? And you also want to check if these online screen time responds to their learning needs. While it is easy to focus on the time that they spend online, it's really about the quality and nature of your online access. One easy way to check whether your child is spending too much time online is to look at this within the context of their overall health and well-being. For example, does it begin to deprive them of time for their sleep or exercise? Or perhaps their participation in family activities or the in-game with their friends? These considerations will help you strike that balance between your child's online and offline. To know more about digital parenting, follow us on our social media. We will be posting more tips, guides, and innovative ways to protect and guide your child as they navigate in the digital world. If you want to share your tips and insights, let us know and drop them in the comments below. See you again next time! One, stay engaged and encourage balance. Monitor the games, apps, shows, and devices your child uses. Regularly communicate with them and help them stay aware of how much time they are spending on their offline and online activities. You can also join them, play and explore with your child, and include positive things outside their online world. Two, create a plan. Establish a family plan and involve your child in the process. Young people are more likely to respond to rules they have contributed to. Three, be their role model and reduce your own screen time. You can also formalize your family plan into a sign agreement, kind of like a family safety contract. It is important to follow through with the agreement and make sure that the consequences are clear for sticking to the country. 4. Use the available technology. You can limit and monitor what your child sees and does online with parental controls. Some apps have features that let you measure and set online time on devices and internet access. Lastly, set boundaries for digital device use. For example, you can have a device-free zones at home. You can agree to switch off devices at dinner time or an hour before your bedtime. To know more about digital parenting, follow us on social media. We will post more tips, strategies, and innovative ways to guide and protect your child as they navigate the digital world. If you want to share your tips and insights, let us know and drop them in the comments below. See you again next time!
Hi again! Last time, we talked about digital parenting. Today, we will know more about parental controls. But before we proceed, let's ask some InnoTech parents first about their knowledge of parental controls. Let's go! What do you know so far about parental controls? Nako, yeah, marami akong alam dyan. Dapat kahit pa paano merong checking ng magulang doon sa mga ina-access na resources ng bata. More on sa mga bata kasi yata yan. Malalaki na kasi mga anak ko, kaya parang wala na akong masyado nakikita on na supervision on that. As a parent, how can we control the the applications, the games, what whatever uh, that feeds the the internet? We're we're busy and for for us to somehow I'm not saying to get rid of them, but to uh, to make them busy as well is to to let them use the gadget. So we, we have to manage. May I ask po what platforms or sites you restricted sa inyong rooms or limited yung access? Shempre yung mga porn sites, yung mga pang elderly lang talaga na sites na hindi pa nito kaya yung mga Mahilig lang ako mag-block. Usually, yung mga porn sites. Kasi yung mga ibang technology ngayon, like yung mga router, may parental control. Kung ano-ano yung mga tinatanong yung mga bigla-bigla. Mga anak mo, nasusupervise closely yung screen time. That's right. To have agreements with your children on when and when not to have screen time. Pero ang challenge doon is, paano namin gagawin yun? We're at work, and it's just a bahay. So that is the question. Four years ago, Insider picked up the story of a mother whose seven-year-old daughter's avatar was assaulted in Roblox. If you're wondering what Roblox is, it's a kid's game where players build characters and worlds. Based on estimates in 2021, it has around 202 million active monthly players. In her viral Facebook post, the mother urged parents to take another look at the security settings on all devices and closely supervise their children while playing online games. After this incident, Roblox representatives personally reached out to the mother to help improve their online safety protocols. So what does this incident tell us? It tells us that no matter how well you try to protect your kids when they go online, there is no guarantee that you can supervise their activities 100% of the time. One way to help ensure their screen time remains safe is by setting parental controls. By tapping the parental controls of some apps used by your child, you can provide them with some level of protection. Do you know other platforms with parental controls? Drop them in the comments below and we will choose a few to feature next time. To know more about digital parenting, follow us on social media. We will post tips, strategies, and innovative ways to guide and protect your child as they navigate the digital world. If you want to share yours, let us know and drop them in the comments below. See you again next time! Maraming naganap sa nakaraang taon. We were faced with uncertainties. You're a good teacher. I'm proud of you. Kaya lang, kulang ka sa training eh. Balikan natin yung rason kung bakit natin pili ang profession nito. The question is, are you ready to own the challenge?
ideyang ito ay nagsimula po nung mapansin namin may mga learning gaps po ang aming estudyante sa pagkatuto sa mathematics at saka sa pagbabasa at tamang pagtutunog ng mga letra. Dahil po sa mga learning gaps na ito, nagkaroon po kami ng ideya na gumawa ng digital app sa mathematics. So, nagamit po namin itong digital app na ito upang mapaglinang pa at mapaghusay yung kanilang pagkatuto sa mathematics. Diyan din po kami nagka-idea since mababa din po yung readers namin sa school namin at that time sa Millennium Castello Elementary School, dyan din kami nagka-idea na dagdagan pa ng innovation. Ang lagi ko po sinasabi, lagi, it takes always a village to build a child, di ba? Dapat andyan pa rin po yung partisipasyon ng mga magulang na hindi lamang po full effort ni teacher ang gumagawa. May mga estudyante din kasi po ako na talagang hirap na hirap sa buhay. So sila din po yung naging inspirasyon ko na ipakita sa kanila na kahit anumang pagsubok, kahit anumang hirap sa buhay, sa tamang pagpupursige at tamang pagsusumikap, kayang-kaya lahat ng anumang bagay. Sa mga gusto pong sumali sa innovation po ng si Mio Inotech, ang maibibigay ko lang pong payo or advice po ay Lagi nating titignan kung ano nga ba yung mga learning gaps o problema na pinanggagalingan. So doon po tayo hugot kung anong klaseng innovation ng ating implement para mabigyan ng intervention kung ano man yung mga pangangailangan at maitutulong ng ating mga estudyante.
Good day, everyone, and welcome to Vision of Innovation, a webinar on moving forward through digital inclusion. My name is Regina, and I am your host for the day. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us, and I hope you are excited for today's presentations. As you know, our keyword, the big idea for today's webinar is inclusion. And so let's start by making this learning session a welcoming space, a welcoming atmosphere that includes everyone, no matter where you may be joining us from. And so we are curious, can you share with us where you are from, just so we can see how many of you are from the Philippines and how many of you are coming from other countries in Southeast Asia. So type in the comments where you are watching us from. Let's see. Hello to Mr. Reynan Aquino watching from the National Teachers College. We also have Ms. Adele Kalolau watching all the way from Kamigin Island, Mindanao. We also have Mr. Soon Lee from Innovative School all the way from Cambodia. Hello to our friends in Cambodia. So let's see a few more comments. Do tell us where you are. Us at Inotech, we are live from Quezon City. All the way from Pakistan, Sulfikar Ali Sumru, hello to you. And Miss Charlene Bagundol de la Calzada, watching all the way from Iligan City. Okay, so don't forget to share this live stream so that we can include more people in this space. Keep the comments coming and share with us your thoughts, your questions, and please participate in the engagement sessions later because aside from the ideas that you will get from our speakers, you will also have a chance to get some Enotech goodies such as this Enotech notebook and pen, a limited edition 50th anniversary mug, an Enotech shirt, and an Enotech tote bag to put all your goodies in. So these are some of the prizes that you will win. And speaking of winning, I just want to share with you that two weeks ago, we launched an online contest here on Enotech's Facebook page. So we shared last year's entries from the Regional Forum Poster Making Contest. And we ask you to choose your favorite artwork and tell us why. We also ask you to share your own vision of innovation. We have extended this contest until June 23. So if you haven't yet, post your entries online and don't forget to use our official hashtags, hashtag Enotech Vision of Innovation, hashtag Enotech Webinar, and hashtag Digital Inclusion. Now, just a quick reminder, please make sure that your entries are posted publicly so that we can see them. And the winners will be announced on June 26. So today, we are happy to introduce to you some of the most respected people in the field of education. We have Dr. Albert Liao, Dr. Ferdinand Pitagan, Dr. Christian Milambiling, Mr. Francis Jim Toscano, and Mr. Galvin Ngo. But before anything else, let's hear a message first from our beloved Center Director, Dr. Leonor Magdolis Briones. Good day to everyone, especially to our viewers who are now watching live via Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Simeo Inutec welcomes you to this online event entitled Vision of Innovation, a webinar on moving education forward through digital inclusion. With the increased use of digital technologies, especially during the pandemic, one can gather that more learners were given the opportunity 
and the platform to access education services regardless of their location and other negative considerations. Students, teachers, school leaders, and other stakeholders learned a great deal from the pandemic that pushed the Southeast Asian region towards utilizing technology for education. This led to increased access to instructional materials, heightened creativity, and innovation among teachers, students, and education personnel. Other innovative approaches were made possible through the application of technology. These were in the form of personalized and differentiated learning, promotion of self-regulated learning, and realizing that learning can happen anytime, anywhere, and through any device. This webinar aims to discuss ways on how we can sustain these educational gains achieved in the last three years and highlight the significance of digital inclusion in addressing barriers that cause digital divides in education. It is designed to stir up conversation and provoke dialogues and debates and further pose the question, how do we move education forward and how can we prepare for the future ahead? I am pleased and confident to tell you that we are now joined in this webinar by passionate and respected speakers who will talk about digital inclusion and its role in the evolving education landscape. I hope that as you complete this online event, you will gain inspirations and valuable insights that can help you design and nurture a learning environment that is inclusive and equitable for all. Again, welcome and enjoy the webinar. Welcome and learn from the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Briones. You've heard it from our center director. Now let me introduce the senior officer of our information management unit, Mr. Jello Arisgado. Sir Jello, can you give us an overview of today's webinar? Thank you, Reg. Let me now give you an overview of the webinar. As schools nowadays transition to face-to-face -face classes and the educators are devising plans on learning recovery, one fact that surfaces is that we can no longer go back to the traditional system we were once accustomed to. For the past three years or during the pandemic, digital technologies change how we deliver instruction. Surprisingly, it also serves as a tool in making education accessible to a wide array of learners. One school of thought can argue that we came to a point where we were able to reach as much marginalized learners and give them access to meaningfully participate in the same learning environment. Another argument can say that the pandemic has indeed changed the global education landscape and further increased the inequalities in the education system. We may have opposing views on the matter, but what remains unchallenged is that we have learned a lot in these unprecedented times. These lessons push the region towards utilizing technology for education, from providing access to information and resources, to driving creativity and innovation, and to making learning happen through any means possible. The inspiration for this webinar is an artwork made by a grade six student from Anini Central School in Antique, a province in the Western Visayas region. Her work was shortlisted in the poster making contest conducted for the 2022 Simeo Inotech Regional Forum with the team on Reimagining and Inventing the Future of Schools. She described her poster as her vision of innovation with the caption, a few years from now, schooling will be a lot more efficient as we utilize different modern creations for us and to be well-equipped and competent learners. This scenario is something we also wish as we move forward from our previous predicament. We hope to encourage the audience of this webinar to consider digital inclusion in envisioning innovation in your schools and local settings. The primary goal of our learning session is simply to provide a platform 
where discussions on how learnings from the pandemic can be used in our current situation. We believe that much has changed in the education in the past three years. We hope that as we tread this changing landscape, we will be equipped with lessons we have gained and learned over time. Specifically, the webinar aims to achieve the following. First, raise awareness on the determinants or barriers that are causing the digital divide in education and highlight the significance of digital inclusion to address these barriers. Second, identify ways on how digital inclusion can help sustain the educational gains achieved in the last three years. Third, empower learners, teachers, and school leaders to harness the benefits of digital technology in education. And finally, identify key actions for promoting digital inclusion. For the program flow, our session will start with a keynote address that will provide context and a macro view on current efforts being done in line with digital inclusion. This will be followed by brief presentations from our three main speakers. And to cap off and end the webinar, Dr. Galvin Ngo of the Ateneo Science and Art of Learning and Teaching, or SALT Institute, will provide us with the summary of the event through his synthesis that will try to weave and make sense of all the discussions and presentations done during the event. Finally, and before I end this message, let me introduce to you to our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Albert Liao. Dr. Albert Liao is the Education and Research Director at DQ Lab. DQ Lab is a global educational technology social enterprise based in Singapore. Dr. Liao is a developmental psychologist and has been an associate faculty at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Formerly, he was associate professor at the University of Otago, College of Education, and academic leader of the National Monitoring Study of Student Achievement in New Zealand. He was also associate professor at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, or NTU. At NTU, he taught in a variety of programs including pre-service teacher training, professional development for teachers, the diploma in school counseling program, and numerous postgraduate and undergraduate courses. He was associate professor and head of department of psychology at HELP University, Malaysia. He was an associate professor at Kent State University in Ohio, USA, and received his PhD in developmental psychology from the Ohio State University. His research interests include promoting well-being and examining the use of digital technology, including internet use in video games in children and adolescents. He has over 50 publications, which include peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. He is on the editorial board for the Journal of Early Adolescence and the Asia-Pacific Educational Researcher. He is co-author of The Perfect Match, health education series that was used in primary schools in Singapore, and is co-author of the book, What Do I Say to My Net Savvy Kids? Internet Issues for Parents. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Albert Liao. Hello. A big thank you to Simio Inertech for inviting me to give the keynote speech for today's webinar on digital inclusion. I'm greatly honored. Uh, to be able to give this keynote speech today. The title of my talk is Digital Inclusion, a Multi-Systemic and Multi-Stakeholder Approach. I'm Dr. Albert Leo. I'm the Education and Research Director at DQ Lab. DQ Lab is a global educational technology social enterprise based in Singapore. Here are the web links for today's event. I'm really glad that CMU New Tech has decided to focus on digital inclusion because we know that in the ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025, one of the main desired outcomes is a digitally inclusive society in ASEAN. Right? By enabling digital inclusion, uh, ASEAN can then be a leading digital community. Right? So hence, uh, digital inclusion is really important. And we know from the COVID-19 pandemic that there's still a great deal of lack in digital inclusion. Right? COVID-19 has exposed uh, various global disparities 
and we realized that there's still a lot of digital gaps, right, in terms of trying to achieve sustainable, equitable growth. So digital inclusion is still a big problem today globally. If we look at some of the data from ITU as reported in the Economist, uh, although more people are online, and we go from 2016 to 2020, but still, right, many are excluded. Right? In fact, the world average uh, only stands at 51% right, in 2020. So what is digital inclusion? Right? I'm sure you have similar stories in various countries in Southeast Asia and globally. In Malaysia, uh, there was a story of a Malaysian student, Viviana, who had to climb a tree right, in order to get good Wi-Fi to sit an online exam. Uh, so she you know, took a, uh, a video of herself you know, climbing up the tree, setting up a place, and you know, she had to stay uh, the whole day there at night. And she put it on YouTube and it, it went viral. Right? There's over 800,000 hits. And in fact, this news is uh, uh, reported in the BBC. But, however, we know as educators, teachers, that digital inclusion is much more than just trying to get access, right? Uh, yeah, access is important, right? Increasing access to technology and increasing ability to use technology, that's important. But today, we need to move beyond just talking about access, right? Digital inclusion we need to talk about use as well, right? How are learners using digital technology? Are they using it in a smart and meaningful way? Right, it's no point if we are just increasing uh, access if learners are just playing video games, right? We, we would hope that they would be uh, participating in educational activities and, and you know, in civil society and so on. Uh, another important concept is digital agility, right? Uh, oftentimes, when we talk about digital inclusion, we focus on barriers, you know, uh, what are barriers that prevent people from accessing technology, or we focus on deficits, what are people's deficits that prevents them from accessing technology. But digital agility is the idea that we, instead of focusing on the, the barriers, the deficits, we focus on people's strengths. Right? What are people's strengths? What are their ways that are resilient in overcoming right, the problems they have access digital technology, you know, just like the story of the Malaysian student Viviana you know, who climbed the tree, right, uh, to, to do her online exam, you know, there are various examples, right, people who have special needs and so on, who find ways, right, to uh, increase their own use of digital technology. So it's good to have this idea of focusing on people's digital agility, right, rather than focusing on their deficits. We also need to think about digital decision making, right? That uh, sometimes people who are not using digital technology, it's not because they do not have access, but rather they might just consciously decide, right? Not to use digital technology. So we need to you know, talk to learners, find out reasons behind their decisions, right? So that, you know, we can be, uh, make some wise decisions about digital inclusion. And then moving beyond access, we also need to think about the location, right? Where is it that inclusion or exclusion happens? So we think about individual level, we can think about the you know, different types of learners, what are the types of learners that are uh, excluded. We can think about it in terms of the level of the school. Uh, what are the factors at the school level that might uh, exclude or include people, right? So what, what role do teachers play? What role does the curriculum play or the pedagogy, the way we teach? Uh, how, are they, how are these factors including or excluding learners? And of course, we need to look at the level of the family and community as well, right? Uh, at that level, what are factors that might be including or excluding learners? So in other words, it's helpful to have a multi-systemic, uh, multi-stakeholder approach to thinking about digital inclusion. I wanted to give an example of one of the projects that's carried out by DQ, right? So uh, just to clarify the difference between DQ Lab and DQ Institute, DQ Lab, uh, I'm the Education and Research Director. We are Global uh, Educational Technology Social Enterprise based in Singapore. We are the R&D and Commercialization arm of DQ Institute. Uh, 
So we provide uh, research and consultancy services, uh, plug and play educational technology, and program development support to any organization building uh, digital skills or literacy programs. So our affiliated organization, DQ Institute, is an international think tank that is dedicated to setting global standards for digital intelligence that ensures safety, empowerment, and well being of individuals, organizations, and nations in the digital age. So it's a non profit organization in the US and a public company limited by guarantee in Singapore. So one of our global projects is COSI, right, the Child Online Safety Index. I wanted to talk about this as an example of thinking about a multi-systemic, multi-stakeholder approach. So the COSI index has been used uh, in 100 countries all over the world. And what we find out is to address this issue about children who have experienced at least one cyber risk, right? So what, what is the percentage of children who have experienced at least one cyber risk? Is it 10%? 30%, 50%? Well, it's actually 73%, right? 73% of children have experienced at least one cyber risk. Uh, that's almost three out of four children. Right? So in a sense, we are in a cyber pandemic, right? Where our children are being exposed to all kinds of cyber risks uh, online, right, which could be uh, harmful content, or it could be cyber behaviors like cyberbullying and so on. So we might be over the COVID pandemic, but you know, we are still in this cyber pandemic. And what we find from our data is that we cannot blame COVID-19, right, because even before COVID-19 in 2019, the percentage of children who have at risk, who have uh, experienced at least one cyber risk is already over 70%, right? And that's similar for other things, other areas like cyberbullying, right? About uh, 2022 is about 50%. I have, I have uh, experienced cyberbullying. Well, before the pandemic, it's also about 50%. Uh, so similar for gaming disorders and uh, risky content, risky contact and so on. The only thing that has really increased is underage social media access, right? Which uh, you know, may have nothing to do with COVID-19 pandemic, but probably just the increase in the prevalence and use of social media, uh, even among children. So what can we do about this? Well, we decided that uh, we develop a national level measure to guide child online safety practices, right? So. This uh, survey, this uh, effort has included you know, 100 countries around the world. And we've developed a comprehensive set of indicators that looks at uh, different levels and different stakeholders. So of course, we first have to look at uh, the level of children, right? Looking at children's digital competencies, right? Their, their use of technology, uh, children's digital citizenship skills. But we also need to look at parents' role, right? Digital parenting, how parents influence, right? Children's uh, exposure to cyber risks. And of course, we also need to look at the school level. What is the role of schools, right? In terms of uh, uh, running digital citizenship education programs. We also need to look at companies, right? Companies can also play a role, right? In terms of uh, building uh, digital platforms and so on. And various policies, right? Yeah, in countries, what kind of policies are there that help promote child online protection? Then of course, we're also looking at the technology infrastructure, right? Uh, the extent of universal accessibility, uh, whether there's internet access at home and in schools, and the cybersecurity infrastructure. So this would be an example of a multi-systemic, multi-stakeholder approach. And just to give you a taste of the, the data we found, uh, the top 10 countries uh, in this list, right? So UK, Japan, India, Australia, China, those were the top five. 
in terms of our child online safety index. Uh, if you go to a website dqinstitute.org, you can find the full list. So how would a uh, comprehensive index like that be useful? Right? So I'll just talk briefly about this, uh, about how it can be useful for resource allocation, national initiatives, and so on. So resource allocation. I think the idea is that if you have a comprehensive index like this, with multi-systems, multi-level and, and multi-stakeholder, you can know where right, resources need to be spent. Right? So for example, if in a country, uh, the children's digital competencies are doing well, but perhaps uh, the level of policies and regulation, perhaps we can see that you know, it's a low, uh, the, the score is low for, for example, child online protection regulation, then right, the particular country can maybe focus their attention on improving yeah, child online protection regulations. So this is an example of the Republic of Korea. We find that there are good scores for school education and technology infrastructure, but perhaps right, the, the scores could be higher for other areas like children digital competencies, family support, and policies. Right, so this is just another a view of all the different levels, the children's the individual level, children's competencies, family support, school education. Uh, these are all different levels and people, uh, countries may have different scores for these different uh, levels. And another useful purpose for this such an index is that then uh, we can have nationwide initiatives, right? So for example, DQ has worked with Australia with an organization called AMF to help them in thinking about assessment solutions and digital citizenship education programs you know, for children, youth, parents, and teachers. And so the potential is you can have uh, real-time feedback right, in terms of uh, whatever programs that are being carried out by schools, companies, or at the individual level as well. So you could have a national dashboard uh, showing the uh, child online safety index scores. So imagine that you know, perhaps you could have something like that for digital inclusion, right? You could have digital inclusion scores uh, across different countries. Right. So the big picture is that you know, hopefully at a global level, uh, you know, different organizations, different governments, academic institutions can work together, right, in terms of uh, promoting child online safety. So that'd be great if there's a similar initiative, right, glo globally uh, working towards digital inclusion. So we think about the goal as net zero, right? So it's just like in climate change, we want to have net zero you know, carbon emissions. So similarly, in child online safety, we want to have net zero you know, uh, cyber risk, right? We don't want any child to be exposed to cyber risk. Uh, similarly, if you think about digital inclusion, we want uh, no child to be excluded, right? We want everyone to be uh, have access and be able to use digital technology. Right. And this finally, it's just talking about the role that uh, companies can play, right? Corporate organizations and of course public private partnerships are always very good, right, in promoting uh, these causes. Right, so that's just an example uh, in, in the area of child online safety about how a multi systemic and multi stakeholder approach can be useful. So let's come back to digital inclusion. So how can we build this uh, multi-systemic, multi-stakeholder approach? Perhaps you go back to this question that I asked earlier, where is digital inclusion located, right? In 
terms of the different levels, individual, school, family, and community. Okay. So let's start off with individual. Right. So these are questions perhaps we can think about, you know, as we are going along this webinar on digital inclusion. So at the individual level, some important questions are like, what kind of learners are being excluded? Or what kind of learners may benefit the most right, from inclusion? So we can think about special education needs are learners. Right? Are there uh, ways that we can help them to, be, to utilize digital technology greater? Uh, how about disengaged learners? Right? Learners are not motivated. Right. There's been quite a bit of research in the area of digital technology where you know, the use of digital technology in the classroom uh, it, oftentimes one of the ways that it improves learning is in terms of increasing students' engagement. Right? Uh, we can think about maybe difficult to reach learners or marginalized groups. You know, it could be uh, learners from uh, like refugee families or transient families. Uh, maybe learners with mental health problems or behavioral problems or children in protective care, right? So it's good to think about this, right? Uh, uh, who are the learners who are being excluded? Then we can also think about it at the level of the school, right? How might schools exclude learners and how can inclusion be more effective in schools? So what is the role of teachers? Right. So for example, research has shown that teachers who have uh, high efficacy in terms of using digital technology uh, have a more positive influence right, on uh, learners in order, in order to encourage learners to use digital technology. So teachers themselves right, can be gateways to inclusion or teachers themselves sometimes can be right, the barriers to inclusion. Uh, what is the role of curriculum and pedagogy, right? So the way, like for example, mathematics is taught, right? There's some research showing that uh, helping students with dyslexia, you know, when there is some kind of uh, auditory component to the lessons that helps them. So we need to think about that too, right? Uh, how curriculum or how the way we teach, you know, the pedagogy might be a gatekeeper, right? In terms of inclusion or exclusion, right? The role of school policies, or even digital platforms themselves, right, can be gatekeepers to inclusion or exclusion. Right, during the pandemic, you know, you know, like many other educators, you know, we struggled in terms of using digital platforms, right, like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and so on. But one interesting thing that we found, I think many educators found, is that with such digital platforms like Zoom, sometimes you can actually encourage more participation, right, from learners because there are different ways for learners to participate, you know, through, through chats, through breakout rooms, or through, you know, online surveys and so on. And some, you know, educators even felt, right, there's more participation compared to like a face-to-face -face classroom where oftentimes only uh, the same people are participating in the class. So we need to think about that, right, how digital platforms themselves can be gatekeepers to inclusion or exclusion. Uh, then at the level of the family and community, uh, questions we can ask also, right? How might families, communities exclude learners? Or how can inclusion be more effective at the level of families and, and communities? Right? So for example, looking at the challenges of transient families, right, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the role of community centers, right? There's been research on how community centers can be uh, helpful in terms of encouraging digital inclusion. And also the role of public-private partnerships, right? Uh, these can play a, a big role in encouraging digital inclusion as well. So one example, I just mentioned this uh, digital inclusion navigator, right? This is like a one-stop shop for high quality information, real world case studies, leading back best practices for digital inclusion, right? At this website, edisonalliance.org. Uh, this digital inclusion navigator was created by the World Economic Forum, the UNDP, and the Boston Consulting Group right, under the umbrella of Edison Alliance. So this would be a good example of a public-private partnership that encourages
encourages digital inclusion. So to summarize, uh, in terms of thinking about this digital inclusion in a uh, multi-systemic and multi-stakeholder approach, uh, I guess I would like to end with this uh, definition which I like about digital inclusion where we look at digital inclusion as a phenomenon where marginalized people are able to access and meaningfully participate in the same learning, employment, and citizenship activities as others through access to and use of digital technologies. Right? And I think we can help think about it when we look at how there are different levels right, uh, in terms of uh, encouraging digital inclusion right, at the level of the individual, the level of school, you know, teachers, curriculum, pedagogy, and at the level of the family and community. So here are some of the references. So I hope you have a great webinar. Uh, and that, you know, as we move forward to trying to facilitate digital inclusion in, in our society. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your attention during my keynote speech. And thank you all, and have a good webinar ahead. And this is my email if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Your keynote presentation has provided us with a better and a more nuanced understanding of digital inclusion. Because nowadays, we tend to equate being online to digital inclusion, but we must remember that although more and more people are online, many are still excluded. And that's something we saw during the pandemic, right? Where a lot of global disparities and digital gaps were exposed. And so we must keep in mind that digital inclusion means moving beyond just access and moving towards smart and meaningful use of technology, especially by marginalized groups so they can enjoy the same learning, employment, and citizenship opportunities as others. So let me just check the comment section for some of your insights because I saw one here, an interesting um, insight here from, let's see, Mr. Marvin Buena. He says, digital inclusion fosters innovation by giving individuals the tools and resources to create and share students' ideas. It encourages creativity in various domains such as arts, music, writing, and technology. By providing equal access to digital tools, even society benefits from the diverse talents and perspectives of a wider population. Thank you so much, Mr. Buena, for that very insightful comment. Indeed, digital inclusion is an enabler of a better uh, and more diverse society. So keep those comments coming. Now, um, earlier, we were curious about where you are watching us from. Now, we're curious about what you do. So let's have a quick poll and tell us whether you are a teacher, a student, a school leader, or maybe you are from a government agency or a non-government organization. So you should be seeing the live poll now on your screen. So just click on whether you are a teacher, a student, a school leader. And let's see the types of audience that we have. All right, so let's give it a few minutes for the others to share their answers okay so let's see Okay, so I think most of our audience 
our teachers or you can also type in the comments if you're not able to use the poll but most of our audience are teachers we also have some school lead leaders in the mix do we have students teacher students some also from um government offices and non-government organizations so let's just say hello to a couple of them ma'am mary jean martirez jaime who is a teacher hello ma'am maria teresa ma'am maria tara clemente psds ma'am marife hanopol a graduating student and aj trencho an aspiring teacher i hope this webinar motivates you to become a professional teacher in the future okay so now Many of our Filipino participants probably already know our next speaker, and I personally was fortunate enough to be one of his students. But for those tuning in from other countries, uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Ferdinand Blancaflor Pitagan, Director 4 of the Philippine Department of Education, Information and Communications Technology Service Unit. He is the Dean of the School of Education at the National Teachers College, Consultant Specialist at UNESCO, leading the team of experts in the design of the framework, strategy, training, and budget of the Open Educational Resources, Universal Learn Design for Learning Policy for Higher Educational Institutions in the Philippines Project. He was also a Monbosho or a Japanese government scholar, under which he graduated with a degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Education from the International Christian University, Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Pitagan envisions a community of practice in technology integration into education which is inclusive, collaborative, and in the service of others. Let's all welcome Dr. Ferdinand Pitagat. Good day, everyone. My name is Ferdinand B. Pitagan from DepEd ICTS. For today, I'm going to discuss how digital inclusion and its corresponding tenants become one of our key framework in determining, creating, maintaining, and even decision making in regards with the Depth at computerization program. To begin with, let us begin what is digital inclusion. Digital inclusion is defined as equitable, meaningful, and safe access to use, lead, and design of digital technologies, services, and associated opportunities for everyone and for everywhere. So keywords here are equitable, it should be safe and ready for access of digital technologies, the word now has become that of a digital word. In the onslaught of digital, it becomes a novelty, and then it becomes an empirical part of education during the pandemic. And now it becomes a way of life and as well as empirical competencies to function in the world of work. It is also enabled by human rights-based intersectional and whole of society policies and multi-stakeholder approaches and actions. Meaning to say that governments, entities, organization, as well as a host of other entities should come together to formulate digital inclusion so that various barrier individuals facing should be given that access and to experience digital technologies. Digital inclusion should guarantee also the availability and accessibility of the internet, the corresponding devices that you're going to use, equipment and tools, as well as services and platforms and relevant content. It should also afford access to critical digital skills, of course, in education, and to participate in a safe, discrimination-free, online spaces, and at the same time to create, to give opportunities for others to create their own digital content or to participate 
in collaboration with different groups in the design, development, testing, and assessment of these corresponding devices, services, and platforms and policies. So it is a continuum of providing access to digital technologies and its corresponding services, platforms, and devices. And at the same time, being inclusive is providing individuals, organizations, and other entities to participate in the creation, in the testing, in the assessment of the development of those policies, of those programs, practices, and, and uh, other digital sources. If an entity, an organization, or even any entities would decide on digital inclusion, there should be an intersectional approach. You should go beyond the usual route of identifying who are your stakeholders based on gender, age, ability, or race, but at the same time, the whole gamut of definition of your learners or of your stakeholders based on religion, educational language, social uh, economic status, and that of disabilities. And it should also foster equitable inclusion. Equitable meaning it promotes fairness on treating different people based on their context, based on their needs, or prioritizing the needs of other people or other group of people over another group based on positive discrimination. Say, for example, if you're providing internet connectivity to schools, other schools in the Bondocks would have satellites and other schools in, in the mega provinces would have Wi-Fi. So based on their context and need. And of course, it should be evidence-based. It should be the data based that are open and reusable. Should be more of inclusive and would foster accountability and, uh, and being used again. Data on digital inclusion should be open to the public, should be open to researchers, policy makers, to leaders in order to inform them or us of what would be the best way to foster digital inclusion. And of course, there should be an enabling infrastructure to connect to the internet and the corresponding devices. In the Philippines, we are the texting capital of the world. We have more smartphones than people. We are the fifth largest users of social media. And those available enabling infrastructure should be not only inclusive to one provider. As I mentioned, it should be based on actual needs of the user. So those technologies could be cable, it could be mobile, it could be wireless technologies or other network infrastructure. And all of this would give access and that access should be affordable, equitable, private, safe, and would provide continuous learning opportunities. Sadly in the Philippines, internet access is still very much to be desired of in different parts of the country. There was a time when we have the priciest internet access in ASEAN and yet the slowest. But slowly, we are improving. And of course, those devices, those infrastructure, those internet access has to be affordable, diba? It has to afford everyone equitable, fair use, access of those provisions, regardless of their socioeconomic status, gender or ability, or their wealth, or displacement status, or their location. And all of this should foster that participation, providing a conducive environment for the citizens to engage in the online world and taking into account different societal, legal, familial, and other issues. Our learners, our citizens 
should be well made aware of that they could participate in this safe environment. There, but there are pitfalls. There are cyberbullying, pornography, phishing, and other legal, familial, and even personal impediments. In the era of fake news, our learners, our stakeholders should be aware that even though they are provided access, even though it is of equitable inclusion, even though it is based on affordability, their participation should center on what is allowable and what is also agreeable to all stakeholders. And, and also digital inclusion is directly connected to the world of work. Of course, in depth ed, one of our key indicators is that of preparing our learners to the job of the future or to employment after graduation from the senior high school. So the top 10 skills on the rise would be, the third one would be technology literacy. Seventh would be AI and big data. And 10th would be service oriented and customer service. These are these skills are directly linked to technological skills, which should be fostered through digital inclusions. And in the job landscape, by 2025, the emerging jobs and other discipline, there would be a big shift of 97 million growing job demands over the decreasing job demands of 85 million. And if you're going to look at the listing of the job landscape, these are all, or most of them, are would require digital skills. That is why digital inclusion is very, very important. Data analytics again, AI, digital marketing, big data, software, internet, business development professionals. This would all require those of the skills in technology, which is the tenant of digital inclusion in order to function, in order to participate in the ongoing reconfiguration of the jobs of the future. So digital inclusion is really very important that all stakeholders should be able to understand what would entail how to foster digital inclusion and what would be its implication on skills, which is your knowledge or your competency, which is your knowledge, skills and your values, as well as to be that of participatory in the ongoing reconfiguration of the landscape of the job of the future. That's why in depth ed, we look at the Filipino learners. So this is our Filipino. So we have 60,105 public schools. Private schools are 47,000. Private schools are 12. And sectoral or LGU schools are 215. Our learners, we have 15, around 15 million from the elementary. Junior high school is 8 million plus and 4 million at the senior high school level. Learners with difficulties across K to 12 is around 50,000. Our Muslim learners are around 1.6 million. Our indigenous people learners are 2.7 million. And we have uh, enrollment at the alternative learning schools at 640,000. So when deciding what type of technology we should give our learners, we should uh, deploy to our schools, we look at the whole characteristics of our learners, not only those who are in regular school, but as well as those who are in inclusive schools, such as our LDs, Muslim IPs, and ALS. Also, we look at 21st century skills. 
how foundational humanistic knowledge and meta knowledge interplay with that of digital inclusion. And in foundational knowledge, digital or ICT literacy, or UNESCO would like to term it as media and information literacy, is subsumed in foundational knowledge and play a very crucial role on how our students would act and how they would value certain skills. Say, for example, in creativity and innovation, problem solving and critical thinking, as well as communication and collaboration, digital and ICT skills would play a very important, crucial role on how they would function, how they would act that corresponding meta knowledge, as well as, as I mentioned, in life and job skills, even their ethical and emotional net etiquette and that cultural competence on how they would react to different cultures, to different people, given the landscape of digital technologies, erasing all physical barriers. Foundational skills on digital and ICT literacy is also very, very crucial. Also, we look at our curriculum, how digital subjects, quote unquote, foster digital inclusion in terms of content. So in the K-3, it is also supporting GT 21st century competency. So even in K, there are schools, even in public and private schools, that are already incorporating digital technologies into their classes. And for R6, there are courses that would utilize computerization. And the computer subject starts at grade four. Again, it is supporting 21st century. So what we're saying is that digital inclusion through digital technologies, through technology and computer subjects are embedded in the elementary education as a pedagogy, as an assessment, and starting grade four, a mandatory computer subject. And in junior high school, we have now the TLE ICT, which are specialized strands, and all courses across junior high school would now have the uh, capacity or at least uh, the capability to include digital technologies across all subjects. And in senior high school, we have the media and information literacy as well as the empowerment technology as well the T, TLE and I, in the ICT strands. These are all supporting also digital inclusion as well as 21st century competencies. So across our curriculum, digital inclusion vis-a-vis -vis digital technology is not only embedded as a pedagogical approach or an assessment tool, but as well as content itself, content itself. And of course, in that particular curriculum, no matter what particular level of competency, may it be from the HOTS, the higher order thinking skills to the lower thinking skills, there is a gamut of available digital technologies that teachers could tap in order to foster 21st century learning and prepare the learners in the line, in the life of work. These technologies are mostly open educational resources. These technologies would foster communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. And teachers, would have to be clarified on what particular technologies that they could use in order to foster an inclusive, adaptive, agile, pedagogical, using technological approaches in order to foster digital inclusion. We are always telling our teachers that technical technologies that are available should be inclusive in nature. It is a platform, a tool for teaching, for learning, for assessment, 
But teachers have to be very aware that there should be no one left behind in terms of technology. If you're going to use technology, make sure that everyone would have equitable access to that technology. If 50% of your class would not have digital at home, don't give an online assignment on an assignment that would entail digital technology. It would only further the digital divide. And of course, we look also at our learning resources. So most of our learning resources before are text-based or visual-based, but now the ever-evolving landscape of educational technology, which is poised to grow one trillion dollars by 2030, according to research, is now more on game base, more now on extended reality, on artificial intelligence, and the next generation learning environment. Chat GPT, or the next generation of learning environments would be more humanistic in nature. And that is why digital inclusion is very, very empirical, that from the onslaught of the curriculum, students should have that scaffolded competency on how digital technologies could be embedded in their learning as well as their personal endeavors as learners. Because with the pervasive technology, we've learned that during the pandemic, it is empirical. It is the imperatives that continue education. We cannot go away or we cannot let the learning of the pandemic harnessing digital technology for education put to waste. We would continue to utilize technology into teaching and learning through various learning resources. And at DepEd, we are also looking and making possibilities that these learning resources would cut across different learners, especially those who are disadvantaged. If you do have a learning difficulties, may it be a hearing impairment or visual impairment, there are technological accommodations. We have tapped the universal design for learning on how the same resource could be converted into a particular resource that could be utilized with learners with disabilities. And teachers are also being made aware on how the whole gamut of available assistive technologies for teaching and learning could be utilized inside their classroom activities. And of course, we look at digital inclusion as providing different modalities to different type of learners given their needs. So we are now into face-to-face -face, and inside that classroom, we could still use inside that brick and mortar face-to-face -face classroom. We could still foster digital inclusion by providing access to digital technologies to students that are inside the classroom or to hybrid and online where different platforms like learning management systems, uh, me, uh, online meeting platforms could be utilized to foster digital inclusion and at the same time to be utilized the digital uh, provisions to continue education. And if we could also combine, you know, face-to-face -face and that of hybrid or online. The newer permutation is that of the Hyplex. This is combining an on-site class inside your class and that of a class online using your meeting platforms at the same time, in real time. So the teacher is now engaged 
real time on an online class at at the same time in face to face brick and mortar not like in blended this day you would be in face to face then the next day all of you would go online and these are all made possible because of digital technologies so policy makers and decision makers should be very well aware of the permutation of learning delivery modalities in order to provide devices, internet connectivities, and opportunities to all students in equitable, safe, and conducive learning environment. And of course, we could also, we look at how digital technologies could be utilized for assessment of learning whether it is a quiz, a long test, a performance-based test, or a national summative exam, there is also a whole gamut of available technologies that could be utilized for this purpose. That is why, again, it is very, very important that our students are digitally literate. So taking exams now would not only entail your knowledge of the content per se, but as well as how you would navigate through online testing platforms. And teachers and leaders should also put that in assessment that not only content should be put to test, but as well as how effective and efficient that technology platform is in order to, uh, to attain the most reflective grade or exam of your students. And of course, at DepEd, we are now digitizing our systems, our schools and management systems, our learning performance, for the teaching and learning, we have now the National Educators Portal, the school attendance and assessment, even the teacher's performance submission. We are digitizing that. Uh, we are looking into the possibility of mapping the learning outcomes through the power of uh, data analytics. Of course, a lot of digital platforms have been utilized by our leaders and our teachers in terms of research and professional development as well as in school evaluation. So the whole gamut of practices, processes, programs, and even systems across the Department of Education are now being digitalized, not digitized, digitalized. So it is again very important that not only our students and our teachers, but as well as our leaders are uh, AOs and other stakeholders, including our parents, should be included in that um, in digital inclusion. And lastly, I know, and of course, uh, also our onboarding and training of all stakeholders are done now through digital means, taking into account the different framework that digital technologies has afforded us, such as flipped classroom, uh, universal design for learning, outcome-based learner-centered. And these are just some of our first onboarding training for our teachers and other stakeholders in order to foster digital inclusion in terms of their competencies, in terms of their knowledge in digital technologies, and skills on how they will perform their corresponding function vis-a-vis -vis their job description or the jobs uh, given to them, and as well as their value preposition of what a digital technology is. And lastly, we are also looking at digital inclusion as a transformative leadership factor for our leaders. So, our leaders should model the way of digital inclusion. You cannot say as leaders, 
you go to the training, you go to the ICT training, I'm retiring. No. Digital inclusion should be modeled by our transformative leaders. We should inspire others, motivate others to follow our lead as we walk the talk in terms of digital inclusion. And of course, through these technologies, we should be people driven. We should have that genuine concern for the needs of others. And we have to innovate ways and challenge ourselves and as well as our followers to be more innovative and creative on how to foster digital inclusion. To summarize, I would like to go to the Matatag agenda of our Vice President and Secretary of Education. During the basic education report, she outlined how DepEd would foster a matatag na bansa o matatag na bata at batang makabansa. At ICTS, we look at it as holistic learning through the utilization of technologies, reinforcing 21st century competencies and to foster job readiness for our students. And digital inclusion would also include efficient and effective teaching, professional development, research through the provisions of appropriate quality and equitable educational technologies. It would also entail robust monitoring and assessment Consequently, data analysis for evidence-based decision and policy directions. And of course, providing adaptive technologies across different learning modalities. May it be an alternative learning system, may it be an alternative delivery mode, may it be on-site blended and high flex. And there should be a robust digitalization of our essential systems, information systems, processes, practices, programs, and policies that cuts across the different level of governance and management. And lastly, digital inclusion should provide safe, innovative, responsive, and inclusive learning and teaching for all Filipinos. With that, Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure collaborating with you. Stay safe, everyone. God bless. Mabuhay po ang Pilipinas. Thank you, Dr. Pitagan. That was such a rich presentation and I picked up on a lot of ideas. But before I share my takeaways, I'd like to encourage those of you watching right now, please do share your own takeaways, your thoughts, your insights in the comments section. We've also noticed that many of you are saying in the comments that you are former students of Dr. Pedagan. So hello to you. Uh, let's make our teacher proud by sharing what you have learned from his presentation. And I'd also like to mention some of our viewers from Central Java, Indonesia, Ave Septia Wahu, Wayu, and from Krabi, Thailand, Wasan Panya. Hello and welcome to this webinar. So let's check our comment section for your insights and takeaways and for the winners of our Inotech bag of goodies so let me read this um sharing by miss wilma salas digital inclusion is a social right of every citizen so much so that our learners should exercise both young and adults alike this right must be covered by the government's provisions of its social protection to make the access to the digital platforms with the network gadgets be equitable especially for our learners. Further, digital inclusion must also provide safety nets, protections in terms of use and affordability, 
particularly now that inflation has plagued everyone in unprecedented manner. When the families of our learners are having difficulties to decide which would they prioritize when hunger is another devil on the other side of the arguments. Thank you for this sharing, Ma'am Wilma. Please send us a message so that we will know how to send you your prize. Now, let's um, look for another one. This one is from Mr. Stephen Lloyd Abad Donis. He says that, I realize that digital inclusion should not only focus on how it will promote progressive education. It is encouraged that it must be contextualized on the learner's need. For instance, we would like to adapt the access of other um, countries to 3D. However, it is not feasible on a certain area here in the Philippines, especially in remote areas. Integration of technology on education should facilitate learning, promoting 21st century skills needed by the students and try not to hinder and incapacitate students. Thank you for this sharing, Mr. Stephen Lloyd Abad Donis. And please send us a message so we know how to send you your prize. Okay, so um, let me... Let's see if there are still some comments incoming. But while waiting, let me just share my own takeaway. What struck me the most about uh, Dr. Pitagan's presentation was how it also echoed the keynote presentation by Dr. Liao. Uh, both of our speakers are emphasizing that digital inclusion is um, inextricably linked with ideas such as human rights, equality, policies, and multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, therefore, digital inclusion must be intersectional. Earlier, Dr. Liao said that we should be thinking about the kinds of learners who are often excluded. And now, Dr. Pitagan is saying that we should recognize variables that often lead to exclusion, things such as gender, age, disabilities, language, uh, socioeconomic status. The issue, therefore, of digital inclusion is not merely an issue of technology, but rather it points to a larger issue of equitable inclusion. And to address that, it would take a multi-stakeholder approach, meaning things um, like the government, entities, other organizations must come together to enable a digitally inclusive society. Okay, so one more comment from YouTube from Mr. Neil Bryan. We are the key players in the conceptualization and implementation and integration of digitalization in the instructional delivery. We need to devise various means for us to achieve our goals. Thank you, Mr. Neil Bryan. This also echoes um, the earlier idea of Dr. Liao, where he said that teachers can either be gatekeepers or gateways to digital inclusion. So thank you, Mr. Neil Bryan. Please send us a message on Facebook so that we know how to send you your prize. Okay. Now, by the way, make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube account. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter so you can get the latest news about our publications, research, courses, webinars, and other knowledge products. And although we haven't shared anything yet, we will soon be making TikTok videos. So if you happen to see our account there, please do give us a follow. Okay, so that was fun. Um, our staff will reach out to the, the commenters earlier. So watch out for any messages coming from us. You can also directly message us on Facebook. Now, moving on to our next speaker, our very own Dr. Christian Hubert Milambile. He is a consultant in the Educational Research Unit of Sino Inotech. He graduated with the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Development Studies for Education and Development 
at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He is an experienced professor with a demonstrated history of working in the education management industry. He is also skilled in statistics, mathematics, data analysis, and program evaluation. Doc Christian, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm here to present to you the findings from a research conducted by the Educational Research Unit entitled The School Case Studies on Promoting Digital Citizenship Competencies Among Selected Southeast Asian Ministries of Education. I am Christian Lubert Pinambili, a consultant at CIMEO Minotech. The flow of my discussion would include some preliminaries or introduction, key findings, common issues and challenges, and lastly, conclusion and recommendations. Let us start with some introduction. The main research problem of this study is to answer the question, how do selected secondary schools in Southeast Asia promote digital citizenship competencies among secondary school learners. This research is a case study design using qualitative data from interviews and focus group discussion among three schools. So one school from the Philippines, one school from Singapore, and another school from Vietnam. For the research findings, let us start with the country context. In the Philippines, there are ICT programs for education. The, the Department of Education, specifically the ICTS, has this educational technology unit focusing on digitization of educational resource materials. DepEd is also working with the ICT in terms of infrastructure. And on part of CMU Inotech, we have this MT40 or the mobile technology for teachers that consists of different modules that the teachers can use to apply ICT or technology in the classroom. The different regional offices from DepEd is also partnering with different telecommunications companies such as Globe and Smart to bring Wi-Fi in the schools. Now, in terms of teacher, teacher education courses on ICT, CHED issued a memorandum order to include the use of technology in the teacher education curriculum for basic uh, for BED or the Bachelor of Secondary of Elementary Education, they have this technology for teaching in elementary grades. Now for secondary education and also elementary education, they have TTL1 or technology for teaching and learning one. And for secondary education, they also have technology for teaching and learning two. In terms of DepEd policies on ICT, they are currently still employing the DCP or DepEd computerization program and the DepEd internet connectivity project. This is alongside with their mobile laboratories that would use tablets and laptops that the students can access. And sometimes they can, they're also allowed to bring it home for a specific task in their subjects. A DEX order prohibiting students of elementary and secondary schools from using their cellular phones during class hours. But in 2004, uh, DepEd also issued a guideline uh, allowing the schools to use their computer laboratories for teaching and learning. The recent DepEd K-12 curriculum also highlights information media and technology skills by including a course or empowerment technologies in the senior high school uh, curriculum. DepEd also conducts a, an annual ICT summit for uh, stakeholders, specifically the school head, where the school head can share their best practices on how they integrated technology in their schools. The most recent one, the DepEd's Basic Education Learning Continuity Plan in the time of COVID-19 also emphasized the use of technology, especially for the schools who are uh, using online or hybrid mode of learning. Now for Singapore, they started as early as 1997 in their national ICT master plan. Currently, they are in the fifth phase of the plan, which is EdTech plan. They also started early their learning management system through the student learning space, where high-quality learning resources are available for both the students and the teachers. ICT integration is part of the school culture, not only in the actual classroom curriculum or subject curriculum, but also in the extracurricular activities of the students. They also exerted effort to develop students' interest in programming and computer skills by making sure that the, that the schools are equipped with the advanced technologies. In terms of ICT initiatives of the government of Singapore, 
the Ministry of Education has two offices, the Educational Technology or EdTech and the Information Technology focusing on ICT integration in the schools. Uh, on the other hand, the Ministry of Communications and Information has this Infocom Media 2025 plan focuses on the better life of all Singaporeans using technology. The FOE specifically also conducts outreach programs uh, for other schools who are in need of uh, technical support in the use of technology. The MOE also conducts public lectures and workshops uh, targeted uh, for parents and other stakeholders. Singapore Cyber Wellness Curriculum, patterned in Australia Cyber Wellness Curriculum, wanted to help internet users understand and practice appropriate online behavior as well as to take responsibility for their own well-being and protection in the cyberspace. This part of the curriculum, they discuss it under the guidance period for teachers in the primary and in the secondary schools, it is part of the character and citizenship education. For Vietnam, Vietnam reportedly exported around 71 billion worth of high-tech products in net value in 2017. The Ministry of Information and Communication also established a national ICT development strategy similar to ICT master plan of Singapore. Uh, recently, around 290 universities and vocational schools in Vietnam are offering training programs in telecommunications and IT majors. For ICT programs and school initiatives in Vietnam, they are most of the educational institutions are using free or open source software and they are using ICT to integrate content, teaching methods, and assessment. The second part of the research findings would focus on the DCAP competencies among the students of the three countries. The first domain is digital literacy. It is the ability to seek critic and critically evaluate and use digital tools and information effectively. The competencies under digital literacy are ICT literacy and information literacy. Now for the Philippines, the, the school started introducing programming at an early age. In grade seven, they use Crash and Python. In grade eight, they do web design. In grade nine, AutoCAD. Grade 10, robotics and mechatronics. These are all hands-on experience using ICT, especially in their programming. They use Arduino, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. The students are also exposed in using ICT, hands-on activities in other subjects, such as English and mathematics. Now, to enhance the blended learning experience, especially during the COVID, the school is using different learning management systems such as Neo LMS, Paper, Google Classroom, and Schoology. Most of the students are also using the Forest app to manage their daily activities, especially as school assessments. The school contextualized the curriculum and assessment. The school head is aware that they are using a different ICT curriculum as compared to other public and science high schools in the Philippines. They are having ICT as an elective class and it is also part of their school improvement plan. In the senior high school, they try to contextualize also the subject on empowerment technologies by incorporating um, topics on advanced programming and robotics. The school is also very active in different robotics competition. And in terms of assessment, they allow the use of mobile phones in some of their examinations. For upskilling and reskilling initiatives, the school encouraged DEP and test the free program, especially during the summer break of the teachers. They are also getting support from different HEIs. From DEP and ICTS, they are attending. They attended actually free trainings on OER, AR, VR, and even Moodle. For the teachers, they mentioned that they are most of them are part of a group of ICT experts. Uh, this is a Facebook group among different uh, teachers across the country to where they can share their expertise or, or experiences of some technology that they are using in the classroom. The DepEd Regional and School Division Office also conduct trainings for ICT coordinators. The school head mentioned that uh, she is also asking teachers to finish their masteral or their doctorate degrees, or for some, they are also not test the cert NC2 or NC1 folders. For Singapore, the school head would want their students to be change makers. The students are aware or using in using different online collaboration platforms. As early as elementary, 
they are also exposed in different learning codings using Arduino and Python, and even different mobile applications development, game design development, and robotics. In adapting and learning with technology, they try to create mobile applications. And eventually, they, the, the aim is to upload it in Google Play Store or even in Apple Store. Many students, especially in the school in Singapore, join after school clubs. The most common are robotics and the media club. In learning essential skills for cybersecurity, the school head is aware that cyber safety training must be accessible, engaging, and understandable. So that is why they, they even train students to do some sort of any practical hacking and, and cybersecurity as part of their curriculum. Now, we all know that there's a growing ubiquity of learning through technology, and students actually believe that learnings should come not only from school, but also from their personal experiences. They are using social media applications to share ideas, participate in discussions, and collaborate with other students. They also want to strike a balance between availability and use of online learning resources. For example, in online forums, they are very active in the topics of electronics, technology, audio, and gaming. They also use technology to get additional lessons for their chemistry and mathematics subjects. On the other hand, the students are also aware that YouTube videos may contain potentially harmful content, especially on the issue of cyberbullying, self-harm, and even suicide. They are also conscious that being online may cause potential harm physically, in demonstrating information literacy through personal experience, the school is actually allowing gadgets in the schools, but the students are aware that these are learning devices. They are calling it personal learning device. And this PLD is part of the National Digital Literacy Program in Singapore. The teachers are aware that they are having difficulty to monitor students' online activities, but uh, at the end of the day, they also believe, especially the school head and the teachers, the social media is meant to be social. So they want to maximize as much as possible the use of social media in different school activities. In Vietnam, they also develop digital citizenship. In terms of their curriculum, they have this informatics subject as early as elementary. And as early as grade 7, the students are also learning different programming and coding. In accessing digital devices and online learning platforms, the school head and the teachers encourages the students to use their digital de personal digital device, such as mobile phones, computers, and laptops. They want to believe also, especially the teachers, that internet is a tool to learn new skills. So they actually allow the students, for example, to uh, access DQ World website for online educational games. In applying ICT schools at home, many parents recognize that their children are actually better at using ICT tools. And parents dealing with some technical issues, but fortunately, the, the, the children were able to help their parents on some of these technical issues. In using social networks and other methods in teaching, uh, the, the, the school head and the teachers are using different social media platforms. They use Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, Twitter, Viber, WhatsApp, and Zalo. Zalo and Viber specifically are very important social media platforms for teaching. This is where they communicate and share materials, not only for the students, but also for the parents and other stakeholders. The second domain is on digital safety and resilience. It is the ability of children to protect themselves and others from harm in the digital space. The competencies are understanding child rights, personal data, privacy and reputation, promoting and protecting health and well-being, and digital resilience. For the Philippines, the students know how to use the two-factor authentication as a protection against identity theft. They also hide their personal information, especially when they are posting in their social media accounts. They also deal with online negativity. They know how to deal with bashing, they teach their parents how to use technology. They ignore unknown contacts. And they know when to seek help from adults, including their parents, if they need to if, uh, consult them about issues they encounter online. In encouraging precautionary measures in online engagement, the school conducts parents' orientation to discuss the use of technology at the start of the school year. In Singapore, 
In surmounting social media intricacies through layers of protective strategies, the students are aware that private that social media accounts should be private. So that means they are not to post any personal stuff online. The students post videos on social media such as YouTube, but usually these uh, videos are part of a school requirement. They are also aware that some competitions require students to give some personal details such as school name and grade level, but they limit it only at those information. They also know how to use the two-factor authentication and VPN or virtual private network. On the other hand, they are aware that social media exacerbates anxiety and depression. In empowering peer support leaders, the school head would want to increase the CW or the cyber awareness topics in their classes by an average of 50%. They also want to strengthen their peer support program and the mental health and cyber wellness education as well. In Vietnam, in being resilient online, they want to protect the students against misinformation. So that is why they teach how to discern between authentic and false information. And they are also trying to avoid potential harm and other consequences when personal information is shared online. As for the students, they, they ignore friend requests and messages from strangers. Uh, on the other hand, they, the students are treating their social media accounts differently. That means they have a different, uh, for, for Facebook, they use that in for their family, but for their friends, they use Zalo and Twitter for other uses as well. The third domain is on digital participation and agency. It is the ability to equitably interact, engage, and positively influence society through ICT. The competencies are interacting, sharing, and collaborating, civic engagement, and netiquette. For the Philippines, in making online communication simple with technology, they are using Facebook stories. The students are using Facebook stories to share feelings, classroom-related issues, and sociopolitical concerns. They also use social media to facilitate communication. And for the teachers, they use uh, their internet school domain in communicating with the parents and other stakeholders. In expressing views on social issues through social media, the students are very active in sharing their feelings about government issues, especially in Facebook and Twitter. They sometimes protect the school in social media by responding to some comments in their about the school in their Facebook account. They also use social media to disseminate information among the stakeholders. In building relationship between school and other stakeholders, there is a school community partnership where the school is monitoring the activities also of the parents and they identify the parents who are working in nearby corporations so that if that corporation can be of big help to the school, they can easily access through uh, the help of the parents. They have a 200 peso allowance for internet and they are initiating a makerspace program for the school and some of their teachers are google certified educators as well for singapore they provide support to students in resolving online issues one activity is that the older students conduct classes for younger students in to share their experiences they the students also seek advice from former teachers there's a parent engagement program this is also at throughout the school year Teachers, guidance counselor, and parents also provide support at home and in school. Now, in supporting student advocacy through technology, the Cyber Awareness Program for primary school students is the uh, outreach program of the school. They, they conduct trainings on ICT use on the nearby schools. They also discuss, the students also discuss social issues and advocate specific causes using their personal social media accounts. To maintain a healthy and pleasant digital uh, footprint, most of the students avoid social media embarrassment. In their classes, they are using scenario-based examples. In this way, the teachers believe that the students can relate easily if the examples are actual experiences of other students. The school also follow the four R's or responsibility, respect, relationship, and reflection in dealing with their online engagement. There's a digital footprint orientation, not only for the students, but also for the, for the parents. In Vietnam, in utilizing online applications and social media for communication, they are using their digital device and social media for communication purposes. For example, Zalo, 
is very useful because it is compatible with Vietnamese speaking users. They also use Facebook to send announcements, instructions, and homework to students. In utilizing digital devices and online applications and social media, the social issues such as environmental issues are being uh, shared or being discussed among the students using also their digital devices. Domain 4 is on digital emotional intelligence. It is the ability to recognize and express emotions in interpersonal and intrapersonal digital interaction. The competencies are self-awareness, self-regulation, self-motivation, interpersonal skills, and empathy. In the Philippine case, in expressing appropriate emotion to strengthen the relationship, the students are being selective in posting on social media. They also ignore negative comments. One uh, quote here from the teacher, I teach them that before they post, they should first assess if, this, if there are words or context that are funny or offensive to other people. So this is how they teach their students to be selective on what to post on social media. In Singapore, in fostering self-regulation in online interaction, the students also ignore negative comments. One student mentioned that usually I am very neutral when it comes to arguments, but then if it is about something that is very close to my heart, I might just get involved. In strengthening self-reflection and counseling in addressing online misbehavior, the school head is aware that their disciplinary uh, procedure or approach is different compared to other Singapore schools. And one difference is that they use the reflective approach in dealing with uh, disciplinary actions. The teachers would want to encourage the students to seek support from their fellow students. This is in terms of dealing with online interactions. In creating relationships, online engagements are important to improve their interpersonal skills among their classmates. In building self-awareness and self-regulation, students trust their tutors and lecturers in college and universities. They also know when to seek help from friends and siblings. In managing emotions, students react positively to positive and negative types of comments. They are also aware that they should ignore dark websites that includes pornography and violence. In dealing with excessive use of technology, uh, the school head is aware that addiction and excessive internet use is very common among the students, and some of the parents are not sure on how to implement control, especially uh, on the access of the students on their internet at home. The, the parents actually encourage their children to lessen the use of social media and perhaps increase outdoor activities. The students believe that the overuse of technology can cause eye strain or some other physical uh, health concerns. The last domain is on digital creativity and innovation. It is the ability of children to express themselves and explore through the creation of content using ICT tools. The competencies are creative literacy and expression. Now for the Philippine case, the, the school instilled a culture of creativity and innovation. This is through uh, mobile apps for translation, game development apps, animation, film production, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, Filmora, and apps for students with learning disabilities. In Singapore, they are changing the form of creativity and innovation. They are using SAMR or substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition as a mechanism for students to think freely and creatively. In the schools, they actually use memes just to motivate the students so that they are engaged in a discussion. They are using GarageBand for music in terms of coding and computing, computer programming, or game design, they are also encouraging the various forms of creativity in uh, designing their own games and programs. The students are also into digital art and digital drawing. In Vietnam, they express ideas by creating online content. So most of the students know how to create digital content that they can upload in their social media accounts, especially on YouTube. The students are also doing simple robotics, short videos, and movies. Now, what are the common issues and challenges of digital citizenship? First is prioritizing pedagogy over technology, responding to changes in attitude and behavior of the students, lack of appropriate tools and equipment to overcome technology barriers, additional training for teachers and school heads, reviewing of ICT integration 
shows very nominal support in policy and program priorities. Relying too much on ICT may cause harm, physical harm, mental harm to students. There are conflicting priorities in students' online engagement and activities. Gaming and social media addiction is downplaying the role of technology. Difficulties in implementing school policies and directions, the need for increasing parental involvement in the students' digital engagement, and an increasing concern on the impact of social media, internet, and digital device on the well-being of the students. For the conclusion and recommendations, competencies such as understanding child rights, civic engagement, etiquette, self-motivation, and empathy needed more investigation to fully understand how the students acquired and used these competencies. The second one is the significant role of social media and the effect of online learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic can be considered a valued input to the DCAP framework. Lastly, fostering digital citizenship is a concerted effort among teachers, school heads, parents, school partners, and other stakeholders. For the recommendations for the Ministry of Education, continue digital computerization initiatives to support blended learning, strengthen cybersecurity offices to manage the school accounts, ensure the availability of qualified school IT team members, continue to revisit and update the national ICT curricula, strengthen the assessment of ICT competencies of learners, provide needs-based training to teachers, school heads, and ICT administrators, quality assured teaching materials created using technology, and sustain stakeholder partnership. Now for the schools, the recommendation is to pursue one gadget per student policy, empower the students to solve ICT-related problems within their peers, establish guidelines on the use of digital devices in school, digital space, and netiquette, align the ICT initiatives in the annual school plan, upgrade ICT infrastructure, and conduct regular maintenance. Continue sharing of the best practices of ICT integration among the schools. And lastly, to strengthen social media policy at the school level. Thank you for listening. The research brief, policy notes, and the full report will be available on the CMU InnoTech website. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Milambiling, for sharing with us the results of the school case studies from the Philippines, Singapore, and Vietnam. Now, to our viewers, you know the drill. We're seeing a lot of generous sharings in the comments section, so let's read some of them. Here is one from Miss Lisa Somera. She says, Tech revolution has become the face of education for the alpha generation. It is imperative that all learners must be given equal chances and opportunities to develop their talents, skills, and values to be able for them to navigate the digital world. Our education authority should design programs that will be made available to all learners regardless of their differences. Teachers, too, must upskill and retool ourselves in order to stay relevant and responsive to the needs of the alpha generation. Thank you, Ms. Lisa Somera, for this comment. Um, here's another one from Ms. Uh, Riyami Canyos Magarina. She says, digital inclusion plays a critical role in addressing the digital divide in education by ensuring that all students have equal access to technology and the internet for learning purposes. This is especially important as digital technology becomes increasingly integrated into the educational landscape. By promoting digital inclusion, educational institutions can provide students with the necessary tools and resources to enhance their learning. Now let's go over to YouTube and read out this comment from Ms. Desiree Dino. Knowledge regarding digital safety and resilience is very important to students. They are maybe knowledgeable in using technology, but not all are digitally responsible. So thank you, Ms. Lisa Somera, Ms. Riami Canyos Magrinha, and Ms. Desiree Dino for your sharing. So please send us a message on Facebook so we know how to send you your prices. 
So let me just also share with you that we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So Inotech has been doing webinars both on Facebook and YouTube, but it's actually our first time live streaming on LinkedIn. So we hope that you welcome us in that space as well. So um, we're also seeing a lot of really good sharings in the comments here on Facebook. And we know that you would like to win some prizes as well. So if you haven't been picked out as a winner, don't worry because we still have one more speaker um, who is presenting. And also we have an ongoing contest at the uh, Facebook page of Inotech. So later on, we will share more details about that contest. Now, let's check on our viewers. So earlier, we found out that most of our audience are teachers. So now, our curiosity is, what grade level are you teaching? So you're seeing on your screen another poll. So tell us if you are teaching in the early grades or the pre-elementary, in elementary, secondary, or tertiary. You can also use the comment section to tell us what grade level you are teaching. Okay, let's see. So a lot of votes are coming in, but right now we have a lot of secondary teachers. These are these are results from YouTube um, poll, followed by elementary school teachers and tertiary school teachers. So I'm wondering where are our pre-elementary, our early grade teachers? So please comment if you are teaching in the early grades. Okay, so let's see here. Mom, Mom Queni Rose Buendia, she is teaching in the pre-elementary. Sir uh, Robbie Caipiles, teaching in the secondary. And Miss Lelani de los Reyes, teaching in the senior high school. Thank you so much for all your sharing. Okay, so now, as I've mentioned earlier, we have an online contest. So this is still ongoing. You may share your favorite artworks among the entries in the regional forum poster making contest. Tell us why you resonated with that artwork and share with us how we can further promote digital inclusion by sharing your very own vision of innovation. Also, please feel free to shoot your questions. We will share them with our resource persons and then we will post their video replies in the coming days. Okay, so thank you so much for your insightful comments. We really appreciate them. Now, before we proceed to our next session, I invite you to check out some of our knowledge products and future events. Maraming naganap sa nakaraang taon. We were faced with uncertainties. You're a good teacher. I'm proud of you. Kaya lang, kulang ka sa training eh. Balikan natin yung rason kung bakit natin pinili ang profession nito. My question is, are you ready to own the challenge?
So IMPAC stands for Instructional Management by Parents, Community, and Teachers. The system actually is, is designed holistically, mm -hmm. uh, involving the parents and other stakeholders, and then the teachers and the learners. Oh, kung gagamitin mo yung impact, you know what the learners uh, benefit most is that they develop their confidence, yes. their leadership skills, and their socialization skills. Actually po kapag sinabi natin lifelong, so the, the learning process goes beyond po sa parameters po ng school po. Tama. It should be, kasi in our the daily lives po, ano-ano po yung na-encounter natin. So, minsan po, yung ano po yung natuturo sa room, magagamit po natin beyond outside of the classroom right, po. Right, right, right. Regardless uh, sa situation po natin, we have to consider that education is a continuous learning process po. Kahit may pandemic, walang pandemic. We have to develop in our learners the socio-emotional learning. And this usually starts from the heart of our learners. Mm. And so, itong uh, socio-emotional learning, pag sinamaan natin ng love, school and the teachers. Pag committed ang dalawang ito, hindi magkakaproblema. Si teacher, sa pag-coach kay leader, kay peer group leader, kasi ito ang basic na kailangan ready si leader sa kanyang mga modules para sa kanyang members. Uh, may isang bata na yung nanay niya ng anak at yung tatay nagtratrabaho sa ibang bayan. So, kailangan niyang tumulong kay nanay sa mga gawain bahay. Kaya nag-absent muna si ate. So, yun, pinadalhan namin siya ng mulyon para sa free time niya sa bahay, mas pasagutan niya yun. At pagbalik niya sa klase, syempre, hindi siya magpupuli kasi makakatch up niya yung lessons ng mga araw na absent siya. Ang ganda, Miss Heidi, kasi ano, kinoconsider ninyo yung family life ng mga bata, no? Yung conditions nila, kinoconsider niyo pa din. Opo, para mas maging confident sila na pumasok. Mas ma-feel nila yung pagmamahal namin sa kanila. At sa pamamagitan ng mamahal na yun, mas, uh, mas ma-excite sila na pumasok sa paaral na. So, doon sa tatlong sinabi ko, so kunyari, program teaching, peer group learning, individual study, anong paborito mo? Umaalala mo yung experience mo sa impact? Para sa akin po, yun yung pinaka the best yun doon yung sa program teaching kasi very challenging talaga Oo, siya. Oo, saka nagtuturo ka doon. Kung baga, habang nagtuturo kami mm. sa mga kapwa estudyante, mm. namumotivate din kami na pag-aralan muna yung topic. Tama. Oh. Bago ito. Oh. Para, kung baga, yung nagiging point doon is mastery. Tama, tama. Ang importante talaga na nade-develop mo doon is the emotional um, intelligence to deal with younger kids or other people basically dealing with different types of people ganyan you have to um, adjust yourself para mapa mapaintindi mo sa kanila kung ano gusto mong sabihin at ano gusto mong ipaintindi and that was really fun for me because i think because of that um I think I became more socially adept because of that. Gano'n ka ka-proud? Kung baga, kung nasa high school ka o nasa college ka, paano mo kinikwento ang impact learning system sa mga kaibigan mo? Na, alam niyo ba, meron kaming sistema ng grade school na napakaganda? Hindi lang naman po dahil sa natuto po kayo magbasa, magsulat. Mm -hmm. Pero isa lang po yung pinagmamalaki namin. Dahil po sa environment, nakakasama namin iba't ibang grade level. Nagiging people smart din po kami. Wow, ang ganda ng term na yun, ha? Oo. Yes, po. Umiintindi din po kami sa kapwa at naapply oh. namin yun sa realidad. Alright, are you still with us? Can we get a thumbs up 
or perhaps you could send us some heart reactions to this live stream. Now, I know that a lot of you are wondering if you will be able to get a certificate from this webinar. And the answer to that is yes. But you have to stay tuned until the end of the program. In the meantime, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the comment section. We will collect them and our speakers will then share their responses via video replies. So watch out for that. And also keep your sharings, your insights, and takeaways. Um, keep sharing them in the comment section. Now, let's move on to our next speaker. Let me present to you Mr. Francis Jim Toscano. He was cited as the best K-12 teacher at the EdTech Advocate Awards in the United States. He also represented the Philippines as a finalist to the Global Teacher Prize and he was a, final, a finalist for Bato Balani Foundation's The Many Faces of a Teacher National Teaching Recognition for the Best Teachers in the Philippines. He is currently the EdTech Coordinator and Chairperson of the Religious and Values Education Department at the Grade School Unit of Xavier School, San Juan. He is an Apple Professional Learning Specialist Apple Distinguished Educator, Board Member for the ADE Asia Pacific Region, and Google Certified Trainer. Let us all welcome Mr. Francis Jim Toscano. Hi everyone, this is Jim Toscano and I have the honor to present one of the sessions at this important event of Simeo Innotech. And I'll be presenting about sustaining innovations achieved during the pandemic through digital inclusion. So let me start by working on my presentation and sharing it to our screen. Okay, I hope you are able to see my screen right now. So when we speak about um, sustaining innovation education achieved through the pandemic. I have three important big ideas to share uh, about our topic. And let me start by looking into these three ideas. Um, number one, we will talk about digital inclusion. What do we mean by digital inclusion, which is something that has been one of the thrusts of the United Nations and a lot of organizations as we look, to, uh, we look towards a future that is inclusive among different members of the society. Since we're talking about sustaining innovations, I also would like to touch on innovations during the pandemic. There were a lot of innovations in education during the pandemic, and it's wor it, it is worth noting that the main challenge is that we don't leave what we have learned, the best or better practices that we have done to deliver education despite the pandemic. And the uh, last discussion is to bring this uh, with us in the present and talk about sustaining these kinds of innovations. So let me start first with a big idea about digital inclusion. So let's talk about digital inclusion and its impact. When we talk about digital inclusion, the United Nations describes digital inclusion as the equitable, meaningful, and safe access to use, lead, and design techno techno uh, digital technologies um, services and even associated opportunities for everyone and 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 everywhere. Um, if you look at the words that I have highlighted, the first one is equitable, which means that regardless of who we are, where we are coming from, even our own background, digital inclusion ensures that there is an access. Every one of us gets to access the uh, ICT tools or digital technologies. Meaningful in the sense that when we use digital technologies or ICT technologies, it's not only because of using for, for, for the use of making of using these tools. Meaningful means that it affects the way we live, that we draw meaning, um, that we create meaning uh, in our lives because, or we make sense of our lives because of the use of these digital technologies. And safe access, which means that when we use digital tools, we know that 
we are protecting ourselves, protecting our identity, our safety, and even our privacy, especially right now when there are a lot of, uh, of questions, uh, issues, and even realities concerning, uh, concerning um, our, the, the way we protect our digital uh, identities online. Um, it's not just access, by the way. It's actually using all of these digital technologies. And, and even in terms of designing digital technologies, um, I, I work with a couple of, of ed tech developers, and one of the big insights that I've gotten from them and, and during our conversation is that when we talk about digital technology, especially in education, we talk about design, which means that when they design these technologies, they are intentional in, in making sure that these are accessible, that everyone gets to make use of them, that there are no barriers. Um, I think that's a very important idea, that there are no barriers in, in using this um, digital technologies. Um, the emphasis is everyone and everywhere. Everyone, regardless of who you are, your background, um, and everywhere where you're coming from. So the big idea or the, the, the ideal behind digital inclusion is that even our, our uh, students or teachers or school communities up north or down south in the mountains or maybe separated in, uh, by, by, by the great seas or oceans around the Philippines, wherever you are, whatever um, island you are in, there should be um, equitable, meaningful, and safe access and use uh, of these digital technologies. So in short, when we talk about digital technologies, it's all individuals having access and the ability to have to effectively utilize digital technology technology tools. Um, in the end, what's the goal? The goal is to make sure that everyone um that everyone has access to these digital technologies with the end goal of improve. Uh, well, in education, improve learning outcomes, better teaching. But at the same time, remember that in education, uh, we can look at education as something that prepares students for, for to, to be part of the society, to become productive part of the society, members of the workforce, but in the end, also to fulfill their own um, their own goals in life. If they want to improve their lives through being able to to uh, to to work in a meaningful job, or maybe find meaning in the things that they do, uh, in their hobbies, in their relationship, in the things that they want to do in their lives. We want to ensure that digital technologies are actually enabling this. And of course, we know that there is this ever-growing concern on digital divide. I do remember a few years ago, we talked about our idea about um, ICT. ICT is our response, um, our response to to the growing digi uh, divide in terms of opportunities learning among people. And we see ICT as that one solution to bridge um, um, that kind of divide. However, because of ICT, instead of bridging or closing that gap, it actually is widening because ICT right now still remains to be only accessible to those who have, you know, who have the, cap uh, the capability or the capacity or, or to, to afford uh, to, to purchase, to buy these kinds of digital um, technology tools. Hence, digital incl inclusion then aims to respond to this ever-growing digital divide in the global society. Now, there are different areas uh, for digital inclusion. The first one is uh, talks about access to devices, even access to a uh, reliable internet connection. We're talking here about digital. Um, inclusion. So it's not just device, a device. It's a device that can connect to the internet. Remember, the internet is, is considered as one of the big human rights that we should be having. It's not. It should not be a privilege anymore because the internet is a gateway, the gateway towards information, the gateway towards big opportunities, the gateway towards a global community where we can be part of without leaving our own um, spaces, our own homes. But at the same time, uh, the main concern for digital inclusion is that while we have access to devices, then we must be able to access the internet through these devices. Um, affordability is something that we could look into digital inclusion. One of the major concerns, for example, of a lot of um, school communities or educational 
uh, communities in the country is the is the insufficient or maybe even the lack of funding. And we know that there are a lot of there, there are a lot of concerns in, in different schools, especially during the pandemic. We've seen, for example, how our teachers and our students struggle, our school communities struggles with access to devices. Of course, our government were able to answer that. But then in the end, we also found out and discovered that our, there are more things to be done in terms of access, affordability. And of course, if you look at this one, sustainability of access is something that is very much emphasized. How do we ensure that that access uh, is something sustainable, which means that it's not only should be accessible this year because there's pandemic, there's a lot of funding being given to school communities. What if there's no more pandemic? Are we losing that kind of sustainability that we have been affording because the local government units have been uh, helping us or because the local um, Department of Education has been shelling out funding? How do we sustain that access so that regardless of What's happening right now with or, or pre post uh, pandemic, we need to make sure that there is this accessible, um, uh, there is access to device and even the internet. We could also look into one area of digital inclusion, which is skills and literacy. Access and affordability talks about usage. Now, moving on from that usage is uh, leads to um, digital literacy, digital skills development. Digital inclusion then goes to the next step. After usage, after access, we now need to develop our own individual selves so that we are capable of using digital tools. Okay? And because we are using digital tools, then we are developing in us digital skills, digital literacies. And, those, and these digital skills, digital literacies are something that we use in every moment of our lives. So for example, when we go uh, on banking, on bank in terms of uh, online banking or digital banking, we kind of put together numerical literacy or numeracy and at the same time our digital skills so that when we use uh, the platform for online banking or maybe um, the application or the app, then we understand, coupled it with, with digital citizenship, we understand that while we're using this app, we're protecting ourselves, we're transferring money, at the same time using our skills for numeracy. Uh, when we talk about uh, fake news, for example, or maybe simply watching videos on social media platforms, um, it's not just important for us to be able to watch these videos. It's also important for us to safeguard ourselves in terms of media and information literacy skills. How are we sure that the ones that we are viewing, the videos that we're viewing in this certain vlog, in this certain opinion-based video, or maybe even a news factual um, video clip is truthful? It's not fake news at all. That calls a lot of digital skills, Dig uh, media information literacy skills. These are uh, two uh, areas that are tied up together. And, and what we want when we learn this uh, skills and literacy is that we empower ourselves. Therefore, when we look at digital inclusion, there are a lot of different areas. We're also looking into the use and relevance of being able to access and use these kinds of devices. It's not just simply giving everyone access. It's not just simply uh, giving uh, the opportunity for everyone to have their own devices uh, at their own palms, at their own hands. It's actually empowering everyone and letting them realize and know that these are powerful devices that can connect to the internet, provide us the access or gateway towards information, towards knowledge that can help us improve ourselves as individuals, in, improve our own community, and even improve our own society. And at the same time, making us also realize that while this access to the internet brings a lot of opportunities for us, it also brings a lot of challenges and disadvantages to us. And because we know this, then we are able to form ourselves up in terms of skills and literacies. In the end then, when we look at digital inclusion, our main goal is to promote equal opportunities, social equity, and economic participation in the digital age. 
which means that we see we see uh, our world that is digitally driven. And because it's digitally driven, when we want to fully participate as individuals in this digital society, then we must have access to digital tools, be able to use them, and, and learn all those necessary skills. Especially because a lot of, uh, in the industries right now, there is emphasis on knowing, on being able to know digital skills, digital literacy, so that you are competitive enough to be hired. So equal opportunities, social equity, and economic participation. Overall, it all goes back to empowering individuals. When we empower, empower ourselves, not just for the sake of being uh, being part of the economic uh, job market or, or workforce, we also empower ourselves uh, because we know that for example, our mental well-being is also affected by things that happen in the digital world. Um, a lot, for example, a lot of, of concerns about well-being in, in younger people, um, especially teenagers, is, uh, are caused by uh, problems connected with um, cyberbullying, um, question of self-image because of what they see online, and those kinds of interaction or unhealthy interaction. So being able to learn how to use these kinds of technologies for the better empowers ourselves, our individuals, uh, our individual selves. Uh, it, it helps us understand more of ourselves so that we can guard ourselves from dangers that arises from this uh, online problems. And then, of course, we try to reduce disparities and pr we promote a more inclusive an equi equitable digital society. I think the main word here is inclusion, basically, inclusivity. That regardless of who we are, regardless of maybe our disabilities or challenges in life, we are able to take advantage of technology and use this to, to improve ourselves, to be part, to be part of, of different areas or sectors of our society. As we focus on education, when we talk about innovations in education, because we're now on the next part, we must consider that in the pandemic, um, one of the main concerns is actually digital inclusion. But because before we go and marry those two different ideas or, or parts of, of my talk, it's also important to look back into um, innovations in the pandemic that have been really, really impactful or has created great impact for us. Um, I I went, uh, I searched through online uh, and I, I talked to, to friends of mine, colleagues of mine and, and in the edtech uh, industry. And we are, I was able to categorize uh, maybe around six to seven important innovations during the pandemic into three areas. Number one, there are innovations that focus on improving the environment and infrastructure in terms of learning and teaching. The second category talks about innovations concerning pedagogical approaches. There are also innovations which are focuses on teacher empowerment. Let's go through these different categories. Number one, um, the pandemic has actually pushed us to, to adopt technology in a much faster way. We call this as the accelerated technology adoption in education. You know, um, when I was writing a, my my book on technology integration during the pandemic, um, I was doing a research. You know, one of the most resistant sectors in the society in terms of technology adoption, it's actually education. The education sector is one of the most resistant. Um, I don't know why, but apparently uh, it's really hard for a lot of schools to adopt technology because it requires a lot of funding. and And because pre-pandemic, we told ourselves that we can do teaching face-to-face uh, -face on site without the, the aid of technology, then we kind of do not consider technology investments or funding uh, as 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 very important aspect of being able to, to, to allocate our budget for the school. That is very understandable, for example, because there was no immediate need for technology. But then because of the pandemic, there was an accelerated technology adoption. And the proliferation of, you know, the surge increase in, in Zoom or maybe video online conferencing um, subscription um, 
the creation or adoption of different LMSs in our school, all of those enabling remote learning. But here's the thing. When we talk about LMS, for example, this has been existent pre-pandemic. I think the beauty right now is that we were able to realize that these LMSs are actually very important in ensuring um, that we are able to support um, different educational tasks, different activities in our school. So for now, I know that a lot of school did not let go of their LMSs because it's now acting not just a repository, but an extension of the learning uh, uh, exercises or events in schools. Uh, because of this, we have also better access to open educational resources. We have discovered that there are a lot of very good, high-quality learning materials that we don't need to buy, but they are available through open resource uh, principles online. So I think it's important that that we were that we are able to realize that there are learning resources online that we can make use of to improve access to learning. Okay, and of course, because we are talking about accelerated technology adoption, we were now able to focus ourselves on the importance of digital privacy and safety. What does that mean? Because we spend so much time being online, our students, our parents, ourselves, our school leaders, we now realize that, hey, we actually need to protect our own individual digital uh, identities. We must consider our safety. I remember Zoom bombing, remember all those kinds of uh, privacy, uh, hacking, phishing uh, incidents because of everyone was transitioning online. It was easy for us to become prey to those hackers, to those scammers. But because of our experiences, we got to learn to protect ourselves. And right now, when things are going back to the whatever no kind of normal we have right now, I think we do not need we must not lose uh sight of the importance of, of protecting our ourselves in the digital world. When we talk about pedagogical approaches, I think the beauty of, 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 of doing remote and online learning is that we've realized that technology is a powerful uh, tool to, to be able to deliver instruction. Now that we are going back to face-to-face, -to -face, may I emphasize that we don't lose uh, the skills that we've learned, the, the approaches that we've learned when we were doing technology in remote learning. You know, when we talk about blended learning, that the real definition of blended learning pre-pandemic as well was to use online digital technology tools, even in face-to-face -face learning. Pre-pandemic, I've seen a lot of private and public schools using technology inside the classroom. I am saddened because I've heard about schools losing or leaving technology behind because they're now going back to face-to-face. -to -face. No, it's that's like 20 steps backwards. We've done accelerated ourselves um, with technology adoption, but I'm saddened by schools making decision to leave technology behind. After training their teachers, after training, making their students comfortable, they now leave behind. Um, I think there are a lot of problems regarding with that, but I, I do understand where the schools are coming from. But I hope they are able to look into those kinds of decisions and, and, and really think about it again. Uh, movement towards authentic and performance-based assessment. We had concerns about academic integrity online. We force ourselves when uh, into accepting that when the test is Googleable, it's not a good test design. Maybe we need to move towards authentic and performance-based assessment, which is better in a way. This is the kind of assessment that we want: authentic, real-world learning, and us realizing that students can Google the answers to our own traditional paper and pen quizzes. It's a big realization towards authentic performance-based assessment. Lastly. And I cannot emphasize this, and I want to take this opportunity to congratulate our, all our teachers. Congratulations and thank you for opening yourselves to learning more digital literacy and skills to be able to teach your students. This was a very hard pre-pandemic. I know a lot of teachers who would say they can teach their lesson without technology. I know that there are a lot of teacher education institutions who do not give that do not give premium on the importance of technology pre-pandemic. But because of the pandemic, I am so happy to note that there are a lot of teacher education institutions, even schools, that are promoting the importance of learning about technology in instruction delivery, whether face-to-face, on-site, or remote.
Now, the question on sustaining innovations, I have three important big ideas. Number one, when you want to sustain innovation, you want those innovations to include everyone, to make sure that there's equitable access, that everyone is enjoying, every student is enjoying those digital technologies. Therefore, I clamor, I recommend that there are policies to be done on digital inclusion. I hope that our Department of Education, our local school, communities, organizations, higher ed, or whatever level you are, I hope that there are policies in your own organization or schools that talk about digital inclusion. This is very, very important because it ensures that we use technology inside our own learning and teaching processes, but we are mindful that all our students should be able to have equitable access to such things. School leaders, your work, your role is very essential. You know why? Because sustaining innovation requires a culture of innovation, requires a culture, a school, a positive school culture that looks at innovation and sustains them. They treasure the importance of moving forward. They look at the importance of moving forward, adapting to the changing times. And the school culture will only flourish if the school leaders champion the importance of sustaining education innovations. And lastly, do not forget that innovations were products, were products of the blood, sweat, and tears of teachers during the pandemic or even pre-pandemic. And if we want to sustain uh, innovations in our school communities, we must empower all our teachers. We need to make sure that the that teachers have their own agency, that we trust them in whatever things that they do, especially for the betterment of the students in their own classes. My final thought, I have one final thought, which focuses on context. You know, context matters. We talk about sustaining innovations. We talk about digital inclusion. And every time I talk about ICT or digital technology adoption in the teaching and learning processes in schools, I always say context matters. One innovation might work in a school. It might not work in another school. Remember, in our classroom, there are, if you are teaching 40 students, there are 40 different children. There, who's coming from different backgrounds? who have 40 different stories in life, who have 40 different aspirations and dreams in life. So when you look at digital inclusion, when you look at innovation in school, make sure that you look at context of everyone. Context matters. You cannot force an innovation into another context. You need to understand your own community, understand your own student, understand your own teachers. In the end, context matters. For me, context is king. And with that, I end my talk about sustaining innovations uh, achieved during the pandemic through digital inclusion. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Sir Jim, for giving us ideas and strategies on sustaining the innovations achieved during the pandemic. We know that the last three years compelled educators to be innovative and so many grassroots initiatives happened as a result. The challenge now is scaling up these small wins through responsive policies, a positive school culture, and continuous empowerment of teachers whose, and I quote Sir Jim, the blood, sweat, and tears of these teachers made these innovations possible. Now to our audience, perhaps you also have some innovations or new practices that your school adopted in the last three years. Do share them with us in the comments. And while you're typing and constructing your comments, let me share with you the I Know Research Portal of Simio Inotech. So you can browse through the variety of educational research publications, innovative solutions, instructional materials, and institutional documents. You can access and download these for free at simio-inotech.org slash I know. Okay, so now let's see what our audience has to say. But before that, let's check back on what our winners will get to take home. Okay, so 
you will get to take home an Enotech notebook and pen, a limited initial edition 50th anniversary mug, an Enotech shirt, and an Enotech tote bag. So to our previous winners, please message us on Facebook so we know how to give you your prizes. And now we are down to our last two winners. Okay, so let's check the comment section. Here we have Loy Batumbakal. Okay, so Loy says, Digital innovation is inevitable, so as a teacher, we must find strategies to stay relevant and look for ways to catch up with ever-changing technology. And joining the seminar by Enotech is one of the steps in doing so. Thank you, Loy. And speaking of Enotech webinars, we have back-to-back uh, -back webinars happening in July, so stay tuned for that. Now, let's see another comment here from Winnie Bernabe Santiago. Digital inclusion in school also helps students to prepare for a bigger world ahead. This is relevant and crucial for all of us. So to achieve this, we, mu we must put a lot of effort, not only for teachers, but also the community, government, families, and others. So this echoes what Dr. Pitagan and Dr. Liao were saying about the multi-systemic and multi-stakeholder approaches in achieving digital inclusion. Okay, so we have heard from Dr. Albert Liao, Dr. Ferdinand Pitagan, Dr. Christian Milambiling, and Sir Francis Jim Toscano. Now, to tie everything we've discussed, let me introduce Mr. Galvin Mo. He is the director of Ateneo de Manila Institute for the Science and Art of Learning and Teaching, or the Ateneo SALT. He's also a lecturer of media and technology applications for education graduate students and creativity and problem awareness for communication for undergraduate students. He earned his master's degree in education administration at the Ateneo de Manila University and he is currently completing his Doctor of Education degree at the University of San Francisco in California. Galvin is passionate about inspiring educators to find opportunities where innovations can make a difference in their context. All the way from San Francisco, California, let us all welcome Mr. Galvin Mo. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank Simeo Inatec for inviting me to do this synthesis. Uh, but I also give a special thanks to everyone attending this webinar today. I hope that it's been a fruitful time for you. So allow me to, to share my screen to start us off. So in the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is to share with you some insights, some ideas that has captured my attention as I listen to the presentations myself. Um, and in doing so, my hope is to help you think about some of the things that, that might be applicable to your context as well. Um, and so as I present these things, I hope that you're beginning to think about your own respective context and what this means for you. So if we take a step back and look at the presentations and remember the presentations that we've just listened to, I think one of the things that we can say is that a lot of them invited us to do some shifts, some shifts in thinking, some shifts in policies, and some shifts in, in practices. So I'd like to share with you four shifts that I was able to identify uh, collectively from the presentations. This first shift was emphasized by Dr. Liao, no? the shift in, in how we define digital inclusion and expanding it from merely thinking about digital inclusion as access to also thinking about digital inclusion as how learners are using the technology inside and outside school and where they're using these technologies. I think the expansion to use and location, not just access, is quite important because I think a lot of us are quite familiar with issues of access, right? Most especially over the pandemic, it's been a great concern of any educator to make sure that every student will have access to devices and as Mr. Toscano emphasized, to the internet as well. But more than that, 
I think if we nuance our understanding of digital inclusion, uh, it also means thinking about how we've actually been using technology in our teaching, but also how learners have been using the technologies that they have been exposed to. So it's one thing to give them a tablet. It's another thing for them to actually use the tablet for learning. So what are the hows? No? So if you're in a school where technology is available, think about how your students are actually using it and how your teachers are actually teaching with them. But more importantly, and I think this is something we don't think about as often, Dr. Liao also emphasized that it's important to think about location or where. To think about where are the spaces where our students gain contact with these technologies? And what are ways by which we can encourage digital inclusion in these specific spaces? So he mentioned thinking about homes, schools, and personal lives um, as examples. So this is the first shift, expanding our notion of digital inclusion, uh, moving beyond just access to thinking about the hows and the wheres as well. And when we do so, it leads us to this sh second shift that I think a lot of our presenters resonated with. No? This shift in thinking about digital technologies away from just thinking about the technology or the provision of the technology, but also to think about pedagogy and curriculum. So most especially in the case studies presented by Dr. Milambili, we heard about what this actually looks like in pedagogy, how schools have used technology uh, to enhance collaboration, to engage students, among other things. In curriculum, we've seen how uh, in different countries, you know, in the, the three countries presented in the respective schools featured, how these specific schools built into their curriculum, maybe technology as content, coding, robotics, uh, as some examples given, but also digital responsibility and safety as part of the curriculum. So as we think about digital inclusion, hopefully we expand our thinking further to not just thinking about the technology, but thinking about how the availability of technology can make positive effect, can positively affect pedagogy, and what are things that we may need to include in our curriculum to equip our students to really maximize the impact of technology's presence in our institutions. A third idea that, that caught my attention is that I think the, pres the presenters were quite real uh, in talking about digital infusion. Uh, they talked about a lot of the challenges that we can foresee and a lot of the challenges that we probably already encounter in a respective context. But I think there was also a pitch to not just think about the challenges, but to recognize the successes and opportunities, most especially as we look back at the past two years. Uh, in as much as it was not an ideal situation that we were suddenly we suddenly needed to shift to some form of distance and online learning uh, in in many different forms, uh, and we recognize a lot of the challenges of that, there have been some successes and opportunities as well. Some approaches in pedagogy that are worth doing more, additional skills that teachers have gained that can continue to be utilized even in a face-to-face -face setting. And so in this third shift, we're invited to not just think about the negativity, the negative things that has happened because of the challenges brought about by the shift to online learning, uh, but to begin to recognize and also celebrate the successes and opportunities and to think about how we can build on them as we move forward. And finally, and I think this last shift is something that um, is worth thinking about further, that in Mr. Toscano's presentation, I remember him mentioning that hopefully when we think about digital infusion and why digital infusion is worth considering, we move beyond thinking of it as just merely adding, let's say, tools for learning and teaching and or uh, digital infusion as a way to prepare students for the world of work in the future, but to also recognize that digital infusion, exposing our learners to learning with technology, to using technology, but also to how uh, to the risks and responsibilities that, that this entails, is also really preparing them to engage in this new society where digital is very much 
part of the physical as well, right? Where the digital and the virtual and the physical uh, and the lines between these two worlds are beginning to blur and how as educators, it's important to prepare citizens, not just for the physical world, but for the virtual world as well. So to close, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Dr. Uh, from Ms. Adrienne Marie Brown. This comes from her book, Emergent Strategy. Here she says, we are shaping the future we long for and have not experienced. I believe that we are in an imagination battle. As technology continues to become a greater part of our lives, inside schools and, and in our everyday lives, uh, in, in the everyday lives of our students, I think that uh, we will probably face a lot of challenges with no clear answers. Uh, a lot of things that we would like to do where there are no clear paths. A lot of problems without no clear solutions. But I think Adrian Marie Brown here reminds us of something that we can bring to these spaces and problem spaces. And that is our imagination. Hopefully this webinar has sparked your imagination. Hopefully through the presentations that you've heard today, you've been able to gain some new ideas, some things that you may wanna try out in the coming school year, some possibilities that you may want to entertain for your context. Uh, of course, we know that how this looks like may be different from one school to another, and that's okay. Uh, but I leave you with this message uh, just so we can end with a tone of hope no? that despite the challenges uh, we saw today in this webinar that there are some things that we can make possible. And by being here, hopefully there are some things that you can make possible in your respective context. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I hope that this has been a fruitful learning experience for everyone. Thank you, Galvin, for capturing the essential points of all the presentations this afternoon and for wrapping them up on such an optimistic note. We know that the work of educators never ends, but we also know that we can build on our small wins to help move us forward. So we've heard from our panel of speakers, but please stay with us for a few more announcements. For those of you wondering how you'll get your certificates, tune in by the end of the program and we'll share with you the QR code and the link to this event's evaluation form. Once you have completed the survey, our team will work on your certificates. For your questions, please feel free to use the comment section. We'll collect them and we'll have our speakers answer them via video replies. Now let's check out some of the center's knowledge products and upcoming events. Maraming naganap sa nakaraang taon. We were faced with uncertainties. You're a good teacher. I'm proud of you. Kaya lang, kulang ka sa training eh. Balikan natin yung rason kung bakit natin pinili ang profession na ito. The question is, are you ready to own the challenge?
Ang ideyang ito ay nagsimula po nung mapansin naming may mga learning gaps po ang aming estudyante sa pagkatuto sa mathematics at saka sa pagbabasa at tamang pagtutunog ng mga letra. Dahil po sa mga learning gaps na ito, nagkaroon po kami ng ideya na gumawa ng digital app sa mathematics. So, nagamit po namin itong digital app na ito upang mapaglinang pa at mapaghusay yung kanilang pagkatuto sa mathematics. Diyan din po kami nagka-idea since mababa din po yung readers namin sa school namin at that time sa Millennium Castello Elementary School, dyan din kami nagka-idea na dagdagan pa ng innovation. Ang lagi ko po sinasabi, lagi, it takes always a village to build a child, di ba? Dapat andyan pa rin po yung partisipasyon ng mga magulang na hindi lamang po full effort ni teacher ang gumagawa. May mga estudyante din kasi po ako na talagang hirap na hirap sa buhay. So sila din po yung naging inspiration ko na ipakita sa kanila na kahit anumang pagsubok, kahit anumang hirap sa buhay, sa tamang pagpupursige at tamang pagsusumikap, kayang-kaya lahat ng anumang bagay. Sa mga gusto pong sumali sa innovation po ng Simeo Inotech, ang maibibigay ko lang pong payo or advice po ay Lagi nating titignan kung ano nga ba yung mga learning gaps o problema na pinanggagalingan. So doon po tayo hugot kung anong klaseng innovation ng ating implement para mabigyan ng intervention kung ano man yung mga pangangailangan at maitutulong ng ating mga estudyante. Alright, before we end today's program, let's hear a message from our Knowledge Management and Networking Office Manager, Sir Bennett Benosa. Thank you very much, Reg, and good afternoon to all. This has been indeed an afternoon well spent. On behalf of the Knowledge Management and Networking Office, my team, we take this opportunity to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise and insights in these afternoon's discussions. These are Dr. Albert Liao, Education and Research Director of the DQ Lab in Singapore, Dr. Ferdinand Blancaflor Pitagan, Director 4 of the ICT Service of DepEd Philippines, Mr. Francis Jim Toscano of the Saber School San Juan, Mr. Galvin Ngo, Director of the Ateneo de Manila Institute of Science and Art of Learning and Teaching, and our very own Dr. Christian Liebert Melambiling, who is an expert from our Educational Research Unit. Such a rich area cannot be covered in an afternoon's intensive discussion. We hope that the webinar will initiate discussion among you on the role of digital inclusion in moving education forward. The barriers causing the digital divides in education and the significance of digital inclusion to address these barriers, particularly as we recover and move forward from the pandemic, among the other discussions, surfaced your valuable insights. Digital inclusion can help sustain the gains achieved in the past three years and identified key action points for promoting digital inclusion. This is the job for our educators and the learners, of course, as well as the parents. And we hope that most of you would have gained some insights in the course of this afternoon's discussions. Finally, we take this opportunity to invite all of you to visit the Inotech website and continue using the knowledge products from the center, not only on digital inclusion and the digital divides, but also on various topics of importance in education and learning. You may also watch out for the online streaming of the upcoming events, the Inotech Youth Summit on 27th to 28th of June, the launch and the awarding ceremonies of the Inotech Research Partnership Grant on the 4th of July, and the webinar on the alternative learning modalities on the 7th of July. And let me be a little self-serving here 
and express my heartfelt thanks to my very own team, the Knowledge Management and Networking Office, the three units therein, and of course, our partners within Simio Innotech who have labored so hard to make this afternoon's webinar a successful event. And we hope that with your insights and your collaboration, this indeed has been an insightful and successful event for everyone. With that, thank you very much. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Thank you so much, Sir Bennett. Indeed, Simio Enotech has a lot of knowledge products in store for our educators. Now, our social media contest is not yet over. We have extended the deadline and you still have until June 23 to share your entries with us with these simple steps. Like the social media posts, the link to that is flashed on your screens. Then like or follow our Facebook fan page if you haven't yet. Pick your favorite artwork from the winners and shortlisted entries. Like and share the artwork of your choice. Share in your post why this artwork resonated with you along with your very own vision of innovation. Then share your post publicly and use the hashtags hashtag Enotech Vision of Innovation, hashtag Enotech Webinar, and hashtag Digital Inclusion. Remember that one share is equivalent to one entry, so you can share as many as you like. Again, the deadline for entries is on June 23, and the winners will be announced on June 26. Now, to those who won earlier from our Facebook streaming and our YouTube streaming, please message us on Facebook so we can get your contact information for the delivery of your prices. We are also inviting you to watch the Youth Summit happening on June 27, live via Facebook and YouTube. We will also have a back-to-back -back webinar next month. On July 4, we have the paper presentation and awarding ceremony of the Senior Enotech Research Partnership Grant 2023, and on July 7, we have another webinar entitled Rebuilding Responsive Learning Spaces, Diving into Alternative Learning Modalities. So we hope to see you there too. And as promised, here is the QR code to the survey. Scan this code or click on the link posted in the comment section for the survey form. Please accomplish this form by the end of the day. That's until 11.59 p.m. Philippine Standard Time to get your certificate. So let's uh, spend a few seconds on this screen so that you're able to scan the QR code. Perhaps take a screenshot and also check the comments for the link to the evaluation form. Okay, and thank you so much. Thank you for staying with us. And we hope that this webinar has been motivating. And we hope to see you in our other programs as well. Good afternoon, everyone. And have a great rest of your day.